It has begun. Welcome to the Nethercast. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. good. Excellent. Guess people are probably wondering who those voices are coming from, so I'm Black Cyborg. Uh, I have with me Razor's Edge. How's it going? Temporary username. What's up? And Shadowloo. Howdy, folks. There's a lot of years on MKO between all of us. (laughs) So old. We each have, what, 10 years in that forum? At least. At least. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. definitely. I think we've all been here since it was called MK5.org. Yeah. yeah. I still type that in. I I never (laughs) typed anything else. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've had it as my homepage for a long time, just so I can catch up on all the news. Um, Well, essentially, we're going to be breaking down Mortal Kombat each week uh, throughout all the games, but obviously we'll give extra focus and special attention to uh, MKX, of course, because that's what everybody's looking forward to or excited by or at least intrigued by thus far. So jumping right into this, starting off, we're going to kind of cover each character just uh, that's been revealed thus far, so that way we can kind of catch up on what we've missed thus far. And we're going to start off with the returning characters. So let's talk about Sub-Zero. What are your guys' thoughts on Sub-Zero? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how I feel about this one, because, I mean, they're playing the big mystery about who it is under the mask. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, as, as people on the boards will know, uh, Kwai Liang is my preferred Sub-Zero. He's pretty much my favorite character um it's well they were sort of playing coy with it like it might be a new third guy yeah like ed was making comments about how there's multiple sub-zeros in the lin kuei and like this guy is the only returning quote-unquote character we've seen so far who has a different voice actor than he did in mk9 yeah but uh it's looking from, like, I mean, he's got the cataract white eyes of a dead guy, and that could be either of the original brothers. But yeah, I, I noticed in the uh, original reveal trailer, even his skin seemed kind of palish, like, kind of like it, as if he was dead. Yeah, well, they've, they've done pale skin before just to, like, make him look, you know, like a cold guy. Yeah, true. But um, from, like, some of the quotes he has, like his intros with different characters, uh, like when... Like his, uh, Quan Chi has a quote at the beginning of a match with Sub Zero where he'll say, "I have your brother's soul." Uh huh. So I mean that could still kind of apply to either character, but he's probably talking about Kwai Liang because, like, whatever happened to Noob Saibot when he was thrown into that Soul NATO, he could be free or resurrected or whatever now. Whereas like nothing really happened to Kwai Liang at the end of MK9 after he got. He died, and Quan Chi has his soul still. So yeah. it's it seems like it's most likely Bi Han back from the dead. Yeah, I I think I agree with that. At 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 first, I wasn't sure, and I think we were all a little bit stumped because, as you said, they played up the fact that it could be anybody, even a new person, that's kind of carrying on the Sub Zero legacy. That there's tons of Sub Zeros out there, but with the new audio dialogue at the beginning of the fights shown off or at least leaked, or however you want to put it, it does seem like it's going in the favor of Bihan. So, what do you what do you think, Tim? Um, well, as a whole, it's acceptable. I mean, he's, he's, he's a blue ninja, mostly. He l- looks good. I wish there was more of a theme to it. There might be, and I just can't see it yet. But uh, every Sub-Zero has had a great theme to it. Everyone has really impressed me. This is probably the first time I'm not blown away by Sub-Zero. Um, I want it to be Kwai Liang, but part of me kind of hopes it's Bihan or Bihan because, I mean, if Kwai Liang is back from the dead, still talking about how great the Lin Kuei is, I think that's what's going on. Then that that's kind of weird to me. That has some dissonance to it. So, if it is Kwai Liang, I don't know if it's the best route to take, unless he he is currently the Grandmaster. But if that's the case, he looks nothing like a Grandmaster to me. He has like foot soldier written written all over him. And, um, you know, I've talked before how I feel, like, I feel like they're sucking the color out of a lot of the characters, and the mask, the black mask, doesn't look good to me. Um, I see what they were going for. They have, like, the energy lines kind of going through it, but they should have taken it a lot further, in my opinion. That one blue cross over the mouthpiece doesn't really... 
it's not enough. I would have liked them to kind of had have have more of a scheme to it, make it look a little bit more elaborate. But um, it'll be interesting either way. Uh, if the Soul NATO thing did happen with Bihan and he's kind of going through the same Elder Gods thing that Scorpion went through. It might be interesting. Uh, it's definitely not the path I would have taken. I would have rather had Kwai Liang, but I mean, I, I can never stay mad at Sub-Zero. I, I, I like Sub-Zero. I mean, he he's functional. He's sufficient. I would have liked a little more, but it's cool so far. We'll, we'll see, though. I, I might find something out. I may see an alt costume that's going to blow me away. So if this is, if this does turn out to be Bihan, do you think that, or well, I guess it is kind of alluded to that Kwai Liang's soul is uh, and basically Quan Chi possesses his soul right now. So do you think that Bihan becomes a good guy perhaps or kind of goes down that role of saving his brother? Do you think that's something they're going towards in this game? It could be a mix of both, really. Um, even if he's not good per se, he probably still has loyalties towards his brother. He probably doesn't like the fact that his brother is being knocked around by Quan Chi in the nether realm and I, I I hope he's pissed that his brother was a cyborg now that he's out of the whole noob cybot persona. I mean, they could find a balance. I wouldn't mind if he was good, like fully good. Um, I, I think the motivations, as long as they're interesting, I'll go either way. But um, I don't see him being pure evil. I just see him kind of being a dick. Gotcha. What do you think, Shadowloo? What, what are your thoughts on Sub-Zero <clears throat> thus far? Well, I'm uh, not particularly partial to either Bihan or Kui Liang coming back. Um, I would prefer it being Bihan, I suppose, because um, going back with my nostalgia goggles, I kind of grew up with Bihan as the Sub-Zero I knew for the first couple of years of MK, apart from the actual MK2 game where it was Kui Liang. But uh, going to the Jeff Rovin novel and uh, the Malibu comics, you know, I kind of grew up with the notion of Bihan being a pretty badass kind of character, as was, was kind of confirmed in uh, mythologies. Um... So to speak, I could see, I mean, I think that's evident that at some point throughout the MK10 25-year period, we're going to have him or some Sub-Zero take on a Grandmaster style of role. I mean, we had one, M we, MK9 gave us one Sub-Zero character, but, you know, it was two different Sub-Zeros in the course of the storyline. We had Behan for, like, the first MK1 chapter and Kui Liang for the rest. I could really easily see it uh, being portrayed as several different characters along the storyline. Um... I can't see him going good. He's always struck me as this kind of character who's kind of, you know, out for self or out for the highest bidder. He'll do the right thing if his own life, his own ass depends on it. Um, it remains to be seen how much he actually cares about his younger brother, if it is Bihan. Um, coming back to that. So, you know, he could want to give him a hand in getting out of the nether realm, out of Quan Chi's control. He could not. I don't know. It kind of strikes me as kind of a survival of the fittest kind of guy. That said, I don't think that uh, if it is Bihan, it'll uh, prevent the, the noob cybot entity from coming back in any way, shape, or form. They could always have that split off or become its own entity, or he could become that during the course of the story, and we just don't know that noob cybot is still selectable. You know, a lot of people like to look back at uh, MK Trilogy and that classic Sub-Zero identity that we never really kind of got an official answer for as just being another skin for noob cybot. You know, he takes off his mask and his ending, and oh, it's someone we've never seen before. Now it's like, you brush that under the bed, under the rug. It's probably noob. Yeah. So what, I, do, you, what do you guys think of Sub-Zero's gameplay thus far? I think it's, uh, well, I, I think it looks good. That In terms of, like, balance, I think they're going down the right track. Everything seems to have a logic to it. I wish Cryomancer was, well, as flat, because when I saw Raiden, his uh, Thunder God really impressed me. Uh, Cryomancer... I guess maybe it's not even fair to criticize it because the idea is to be is precision, you know, ice smithing. I don't really have a word for that, yeah. but it 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 looks good. I wish it was a little more because Sub Zero is kind of like a wizard to me. You know, when you play as him, he doesn't play like a ninja. He plays like a very patient wizard like spell casting type to me. So now that he's doing more of a rushdown, I, I wish like his chain combos had a little more cryomancy to it. I wish that uh, the Ice Hammer just... It's really hard to articulate why it doesn't look as impressive to me. Because on paper, it's good, but... I don't know, maybe it's the combo combinations? Like, I don't... I, it just it doesn't look like he's going... It doesn't look like his cryomancy has been turned up to 11. But it's hard to explain why. Why it worked with Raiden and not with Sub-Zero. 
How about you, Razor? Are you excited from what you see from Sub Zero's gameplay? Uh, well, I mean, he's got he's got three styles. There's Unbreakable, where he sort of has more shields and defensive uh moves. It seems like uh, mm. that doesn't look too interesting to me. That's not really to my style. And uh, Temp mentioned Cryomancy. Uh, the one I'm really excited for is Grandmaster, mostly because he now has the ability to pick up his ice clones and throw them at you. Yeah, I thought that looked pretty neat, and it's definitely a cool addition. Yeah, and um, but I guess while I'm talking about uh, Grandmaster, I want to go back to something story-related quick for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, when you pick the Grandmaster uh, variation, it puts a medallion on his uh, outfit, but that medallion doesn't have a dragon on it. It's just another Lin Kuei logo. So I feel like, I mean, it's sort of confusing, like, in in his intros, he's coming in and he's talking about, in some of the ones he has with Scorpion, he's talking about, like, he's loyal to the Lin Kuei still, and he still cares about the clan, and he still hates the Shirai Ryu. Uh -huh. And it's and it's like, well, the last time we saw the Lin Kuei, Sector was kind of in charge, and the, you know, everybody was being turned into robots. So it's like, does he come back and stop Sector and take over? Like, does he do what Kwai Liang did in the old timeline? Or is the Grandmaster style just named as, like, an Easter egg? Like, it's just a reference for the fans, and it doesn't actually have anything to do with anything. Yeah, see, that's what something I was wondering myself, is that it doesn't seem like he has anything to do with being a Grandmaster of uh, the Lin Kuei, just based on... You know, the, the the way the story direction was going, and like you said, the medallion isn't the medallion that he got previously, so it's kind of confusing in that aspect. So I almost think if I had to put my money on anything, it would be that it's just basically an Easter egg or a callback or whatever you want to call that. So it'll be interesting to see what direction that takes for sure. Um, Shadowloo, any thoughts on Sub-Zero's gameplay? I am definitely most excited for the Grandmaster play style. I've <clears throat> my most fondest memories of Sub Zero basically come from MK3 before Ultimate MK3 actually. Uh, he was one of the guys that people used a hell of a lot in my local arcade scene, and back then they didn't really have so much restrictions on the zoning properties or how close you could actually get to your opponent by and throw out an ice clone and get away with it. You know, so you had people running in all the time, close distance, putting in ice clones basically like putting these extensive traps and ice showers. It was wonderful. So Grandmaster is the one that I'm definitely most excited to play. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I really like um, Grandmaster for the reason you guys said. I like the clone ability, being able to throw clones. I like the Cryomancer just because I like the idea of him conjuring weapons out of ice and stuff that we've seen previously in games just played up more. Um, I do think it's weird that he throws his ice ball with one hand now instead of his classic kind of pose. That's that was an odd change to make, but it does seem like it comes out faster. So who knows if uh, why they did that, or maybe they're just trying to separate Bihan from Kwai Kwai Yang's uh, play style, basically. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm excited to see more from Sub Zero. What do you guys think of uh, his fatality thus far? The one that we've seen, I believe, in full. Any thoughts? I actually really like it. Um, there's an expression in the fighting game community, for specifically for MK, of getting your back blown out. That started to become a popular expression. And uh, yeah, that's literally what he does, is he freezes your chest and he fucking blows your back out. I mean, it's. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was intentional. I imagine it would have to be, because we've seen other things in Injustice where there were intentional allusions to the community. So um, the whole splitting him in half, uh, after the end of the fatality, uh, I know it's it's an allusion to MK3, but I, I think it looked a little better in MK3. I, I feel I don't like fatalities when they're redundant. If the dude's already dead, it doesn't do anything for me. All, all the post mortem is not my thing, but it doesn't look bad though. I'm I'm a fan so far. Yeah, I I have to agree with you on that point. I don't I don't like when they basically leave a guy for dead or even go as far as killing them. And then do something else to it. It's that at that point, it's like there's there's no point to that. Now you're just it's almost as if they're they're like, well, it would be cool to do this, but hey, we should do this because it's an homage to this, or we should do this because oh, that sounds even more crazy and over the top. But it's like if you're killing the guys and he's already dead, then what's the point after that? I think freezing their chest 
re you know shattering it and reaching in and breaking their spine that's that's incredibly deadly right i mean that's just that's just an awesome right there why what's the need to go over the top exactly especially if it doesn't fit the character if the character wouldn't do something post-mortem then well, in this case it's not so bad you know if sub-zero's pissed enough i could see him splitting a corpse in half some characters not so much i wouldn't be able to see like Liu kang or Jax doing a lot of post-mortem right even though mk9 was obviously you know contradicting that with Jax, but <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so yes that, that's a bit silly um any other thoughts on the fatalities or on his fatality if it's Bihan, I think it absolutely does suit him. It's nah, he's a bit of a jerk. <laughs> it, it absolutely does make me uncomfortable to see someone's spine frozen and just shattered with someone's bare hands. Ah, ah. Spine injuries really do kind of get me. But tearing them apart in half afterwards and just tossing the pieces down, that's a Bihan dick move. He'd do it. <laughs> he's just the bully <laughs> of MK. Yeah, um... if he is if he is Noob Saibot and he's, he's he's come back, I think he's probably still got a, more than a little bit of nether in him. He's he's angry enough. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, I think the thing with fatalities is like, like personality and continuity sometimes have nothing to do with it. Because I mean, you you look at Kung Lao, and you know he's a monk, and sometimes he's <laughs> a pacifist, and then he's got some of the most brutal finishers where he's like cutting you down the middle. Yeah, oh, like, that, that's true. That, that, that or one dragging you last time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and then and then there's like MK3 where Jax can grow into a giant, and Cabal's face scares you to death. Yeah, I guess that's a fair point. There's no real so, s sense in making sense out of it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes that bothers me, because then it muddies the question of, like, which powers do these guys actually have? Because, like, I'm sure Jax can't grow into Giant Man, but can <laughs> Liu Kang turn into a dragon? That, yeah. That what is benefits of winning the MK tournament? That's a very good point to point out, because, yeah, over over the years, the consistency really hasn't been there. I mean, they've tried... They've tried... Or they have... They have at least tried to establish consistency going forward. I think MK3 was the thing that really kind of set it off. But then we had Scorpion turning it into a Scorpion in Mortal Kombat 4. So you don't really... Yeah, I agree with you. It's kind of up in the air. I don't think they take things too seriously. Not nearly as serious as we all take them as fans. So it is kind of... I guess overanalyzing things to that point really isn't necessary. But for the sake of it. <laughs> yeah, I just... I, I just, wish Kung Lao wouldn't drag people over hats. That's, that's <laughs> At least not balls first. I mean, try the other end, you know? The hell kind of monk upbringing did you have, honestly? Yeah, right? Like, he's he's the angry one. He's always <laughs> like, the, you know, I wanted to be the champion, Liu yeah. Kang. What kind of monk gets jealous? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, any other thoughts on uh, Sub-Zero's fatality? Um... I don't know. I think it looks really cool when he reaches in the hole and snaps their spine. Yeah, it's definitely a really cool visual. And I, I, I guess at the end, that's all that matters. As long as it looks effective and, you know, it, it's delivered with a good presentation, which I think his fatality definitely is. Whether the ending result is absolutely necessary to rip them in half. But regardless, yes, it definitely looks cool. For sure. Alright, well, let's move on to Scorpion. Um, we'll start off with some scorpion story thoughts and just analyzing where you think he might be going anybody have any ideas razor do you know where or do you have any thoughts on where scorpion's direction might be going story wise um, yeah i have uh a lot actually i might get long-winded here <laughs> um well the first thing is like people talk a lot about how scorpion's story sort of repeats over and over again all the time like he's always just revenge 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 yeah there's um there's an element of truth to that, but it's mostly, like, the more recent games. Because, like, when Tobias was the writer, the Scorpion actually went through a lot of evolution in the first couple games. Like, because in MK2, like, he thinks, well, I killed Sub-Zero, but he's back now, so I might have to kill him again. And then he shows up, and he finds out it's his brother, and he's like, you know what? I was supposed to rest in peace when I got my revenge, and I'm not doing that. And it's not because I didn't kill Sub-Zero. So maybe what I'm supposed to be doing is, like, atoning for my sins and stuff. And, like, I should, you know, watch over this new Sub-Zero to, like, make up for the fact that I killed his brother. And then, like, in MK3, his story is about, like, uh, I'm still in hell. I'm still not resting in peace. I gotta get out of here. I'll do anything to leave hell. So he ends up working for Shao Kahn. 
and then he finds out that uh, Kui Liang is on the other team and immediately switches sides because he still has that vow. And he's like, you know, that, that shows that it's not really about revenge anymore. It's just about, you know, he wants to, I don't know if I want to say do the right thing, but, like, he has, like, a sense of honor and, like, he's trying to get out of hell and, like, go to heaven and be with his family or something like that, you know? Yeah. And sure. and then in the later games, they just sort of reverted him back to revenge, 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 which is disappointing. And, I mean, we're we're at a point now, because of the reboot, where he doesn't know Quan Chi is the one who killed his family. So he's probably going to find out and go after them for that. But there's sort of an interesting thing, I think, in, first of all, in his dialogues with uh, Sub-Zero before their fights, the way they talk, I mean, there's still, like, a clan rivalry, like, they don't like each other, but he doesn't seem to, like, hate hate him anymore. Like, he's not still out for revenge against Sub-Zero. Yeah. It's almost like they're, they're enemies, but in a more neutral way. So that shows that the dynamic has changed. And another thing that I think is interesting is we've seen uh, some of those covers for the comic book that's coming up. And mm -hmm. there's like there's concept art of like a, a new Lin Kuei guy. Or Shirai Ryu, I mean. There's a new Shirai Ryu guy. And he's got like this uh, red and gray outfit. And he looks like uh, a black guy, I guess. Some people are saying. Uh -huh. And um... It's sort of, I wonder if he's supposed to be from a flashback to before they died, or if part of Scorpion's story is that he's actually going to start a new Shirai Ryu, like try to bring them back. Yeah, that's an interesting thought for sure. Because I don't, I, did they say anything about the comics covering stuff, like from uh, the writer previously? Says, the writer has said that uh, it's sort of covers like he was sort of vague about it but he said most of the story takes place 10 years after mortal kombat 9 like it's like right in the middle of that 25 year timeline the game's in interesting so yeah it definitely seems like it's more likely that he starts a new one but also yeah i guess there always is that possibility that it is just a flashback so we'll have to see because just because it doesn't like take place in a previous time doesn't mean it can't just be a simple flashback of scorpion some story relevant pro uh, plot line or something yeah but like as, if it is a flashback it's a little like curious to me because i mean the lin kuei has like an international membership like they'll take anybody if you've got powers yeah but the shirai ryu is straight up japanese ninja so that there's a black guy in there if it is a flashback it's a little weird true for sure any other thoughts on scorpion's story Um, I guess, uh, I guess I'm not too picky when it comes to Scorpion. I've, I've kind of accepted what they've done with him recently. Uh, I do miss the MK2, MK3, Protect Your Scorpion. That was my favorite story thread that he ever went through. Um, as for this game, I'm not particular about anything. I just, I hope we do get to see multiple dimensions. I feel like the writers forgot that Scorpion was a family man, that he was a father. And I would like to see some of that, um... Cause, I mean, and, and there's you can have both worlds. You can make him still hate Sub Zero, still hate the Elder Gods, or not hate the Elder Gods, or be mad at Raiden, and still show that side. That should be able to color everything else. I think in a way, I, I think a good writer can do that. Um, but right now, um, it doesn't look like we're seeing much of that. I felt like we didn't see a lot of that in MK9. I felt like maybe glimpses in the beginning of the first tournament, but. They, they didn't expand upon it. And that's all I really want. If he has a great story, cool. I'm not really following Scorpion much these days anymore. But I like the design a lot. I think the design has a very sophisticated MK1 feel to it. I think that was a good move. I wish it was a little more spectral, but I'll take what I can get. If, I, if it's good, it's good. I'm not going to be too picky if they get that much right. Because in the last game, there were some problems. I don't think it was shit, but there were some problems with it. And right now, we're at a good place with Scorpion. Oh, definitely. I think his outfit, like his whole appearance definitely is far and beyond better than MK9. And that's not that MK9 was completely awful in my opinion, but I agree with the majority that have stated that it's way too over-designed. I didn't care for all the like texture in the leather and how they, they 
basically put more black on him than yellow and just all like the over design textures in general they tried to put little designs in every little part of his outfit and that just that's just too much and I think this time it looks way better I like the hood on Scorpion better I think of all the uh, quote unquote ninja palette swaps from the old Mortal Kombat games I think Scorpion should be the one with the hood. I think he it, it just looks perfect on him and I'm really liking his attire in this game. Yeah, I think they kind of took the ninja out of Scorpion last time more than a little bit. Uh the actual Scorpion over his face. It was overdesigned is definitely the word. But uh this time no, uh, he's he's definitely required the whole ninja stick that he lost. I love the render where he's like I kind of got the spear coming out of his wrist area a little bit and that just looks actually looks like they're considering some sort of stealth element to him. It'd be really wonderful to see that. Yeah. Um, Story-wise, I have some sort of high hope for him. I really enjoyed that moment back in MK9 where Raiden almost convinced him to not kill Sub. It shows us he's not entirely and always an angry jerk, blinded by rage all the time. I do feel that this time he'll probably get his crack at Quan Chi, like you guys have mentioned. But we'll see what else has to show for him. Rebuilding the CRA was kind of a thing last time around, which they didn't really get uh, around to establishing much on. But it'd be really interesting if, some, if at some point during this uh, during this 25 year period he actually does yet to do that. Who knows? Maybe he does actually escape from hell again this time through. Start, start something up on Earth. That'd be very fascinating. I find. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, thoughts on uh, Scorpion's gameplay? Has anybody got any thoughts? Uh, temporary. You want to start us off? Um, it looks like he has a lot of space control with his first two variations, which could be fun. Uh, there's a lot of characters in other fighting games who do have good spacing, but still have good pressure, good rushdown, and they can play that footsie game nonetheless. Um, if I can't do that, I'm defaulting to a ninjutsu, because when I'm playing a zoning game, I don't really feel like I'm in control. I want to be able to pressure, I want to be able to get in. Uh, I don't want to let the other player make the first move. Um, but I may be able to do that with the other variations. We don't know yet. Um, I probably won't pick the uh, Inferno. Wait, not Inferno. Uh, it's the one where he uh, summons the creature. Does anyone got the name uh, of that? That is Inferno. Hellfire is the one where he has more fire. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, Inferno. I'm probably not going to be using that much because I don't think of Scorpion having like a familiar, having like a, That's a sidekick. That just, it doesn't fit with my image of Scorpion. And uh, Speaking of which, real quick, before I... Uh, pass this on uh, to you guys. Um, I do like the fact that there is no spectral, even though I just said I, I wish there was a more spectral element to Scorpion. It is kind of cool, though, that when he does take his mask off, it is kind of a surprise that there's a skull there. He doesn't wear the whole spectral thing on his sleeve. It looked cool, but I'm glad that kind of mystery is back. But as for gameplay, yeah, everything looks good so far. I just hope he's a good character. Scorpion had a lot of problems in the last game, and he didn't need to. He had the perfect move set. He had great tools, but his normals weren't very good. His mobility wasn't terribly good. There were some things that were unsafe that shouldn't have been unsafe, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. How about you, Razor? Um, well, I'm I'm sort of interested in Inferno. Like, I'm not sure that it does fit him, but maybe there's a story behind it. Like that, because he has this like skull on a rope that he pulls out to do the summon and i'm wondering is that like a story item like a plot device yeah but i don't know i think it's interesting and i think um i'm not sure all what it can do but it seems like it might be if noob cybot's not in this game because behind sub-zero again it seems like that might be one of the ways in which they sort of replace his shadow clone move set they've given scorpion this thing yeah, that's possible. It does. It definitely seems like it. It it has a lot of it has a lot of the same elements, and I think if if there's going to be certain characters that don't make the game, at least judging by past games, it seems like they always find a way to fit in some of the more like popular fan favorite characters move sets into some of the characters that do make the game. So it, it would be interesting if that is the case that. If Noob Zybot does not make it because uh, Sub Zero is now behind again, um, that Scorpion takes some of his elements from his move set. So that would definitely be uh, my opinion on that matter. If that if that does turn out to be the case, that's what I'm thinking as well. Yeah, and um, there's the uh, Hellfire style. I don't know how I feel about that one. 
because Blade Fire is a very strange thing for Scorpion. Yeah, to actually I mean, do. I've always liked um, the moves he, like in uh, MK versus DC, I think was the first time he had it where he'd light himself on fire, and if you were too close, you took damage. Yeah. And I think this is the style that has uh, that. Yeah, it is. It's the flame or move. Yeah, but um, the the actual just the ball of fire, just making a ball and chucking it for yeah. the first time. I feel like that doesn't really. I don't like that Scorpion has it because it's sort of a generic thing, and it's, you know, Liu Kang throws fireballs, and Shang Tsung has thrown fireballs, and Tanya has thrown fireballs, and it's just sort of the most um, sort of lame a move you can have is just a ball of orange fire. <laughs> They've been, ever since the old days, man, I'd say probably since MK. Three and four, they've been gradually, gradually playing up Scorpion's role as being a fire wielder for a long time. I'm not surprised, but I do kind of miss it when it was just a guy who controlled fire. I mean, I got controlled ice versus a guy who was dead and happened to breathe a little bit of fire. But now it's becoming a kind of a straight fire versus ice thing, which is a little cliche and predictable to me. Yeah, I prefer him just throwing spears at people. And not to mention, it seems like not not everybody needs a projectile. Not everybody needs that sort of projectile attack and to just give scorpion uh scorpion a fireball after he already has his you know trademark iconic spear it just seems I don't, it just seems unnecessary i agree i think the other games did it right where scorpion would take off his mask and he would have a ranged fire special move that made more sense to me because it wasn't a traditional projectile but i believe he, i want to say it was in deadly alliance where he could actually take his mask off and breathe uh, fire. it was mk4 so yeah, MK4, a there you go. Close range one. Which, and that fits. That's consistent, in my opinion. Now that you bring yeah. up Deadly Lines, that makes me think back to the trailer where he's actually shooting fireballs at the acid bath statues. Yeah. So right. they never even went with that. So this is obviously not the first time they've thought about giving him the ability to start throwing fireballs around. And it's interesting to see that they, even though they thought about it before, they ended up not going with that in the actual game, and they didn't do it in Deception or Armageddon or Verse DC or MK9, so it's kind of interesting that they're like, hey, now that we're doing these variations, let's give Scorpion that fireball that we thought about a long time ago. So it's just it's interesting how they would, I guess, decide to finally give him that, which, as we said, I don't, I don't think that's quite necessary for his character. But uh, any uh, any other thoughts on his gameplay, or you guys want to talk about his fatality? Because his fatality is one of those that apparently they don't want anybody to see in its complete form, even though it's been leaked out there, and I'm sure we've all seen it. But any any uh, other thoughts on his gameplay before we move on to his fatality? I'm probably going to be sticking with ninjutsu for the interim. I don't feel entirely comfortable with Inferno at all. Hellfire maybe a little bit, apart from the fire militia that we mentioned, but uh, no. Dual swords. I like when Scorpion works with his blades. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Stick with that. I think uh, I think I'm gonna have to try them out a little before I figure out which one I really like. Cause uh, I mean, ninjutsu does seem the most suited to me. Like as a, I tend to play rushdown more than anything. But um, I've never really liked Scorpion with swords, and I feel like it's sort of a big missed opportunity that they've never had like a playstyle for him where he uses his spear like a rope dart and just spins it around and stuff. Like he had some moves that did that in uh, Shaolin monks, but he's never done it in the fighting games. That's true. Yeah, it is. That is a that's a fair point. I mean, why if if it's if it, his spear is so iconic, why not try and incorporate it more than just get over here and his throw in MK9? Which do we know what his throw is in? Uh, in this game yet? Does anybody can anybody recall what his throw mm -hmm. animation is this time? I actually don't know. I'm trying to think about it, but I can't. No, I think it's similar. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's the same. But uh, I know his X-ray is kind of reminiscent of his throw, right? I don't yeah. know. Doesn't he use his spear in his X-ray? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's towards the skull, right? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, it is kind of curious to see what or why they haven't implemented his spear into more because there's a lot of things you can do with it i mean you could he could tack their legs with it to trip them up there's just in his normal it doesn't even have to be special moves just in his normal fighting like as in the case with some of his um using his swords they could use his spear in his normal combos and i think that would look really really awesome because it's unlike any other weapon anybody has in the game 
Probably had a pair of axes and ultimate MK3 that he just whip out for no particular reason to win combos. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right, the mini battle axe. I forgot about that. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I guess it's time to talk about Scorpion's Fatality. Um, anybody uh, have any thoughts to start us off? I'll, I, or I guess I got something I want to say. He, or first we should present what the Fatality is and then talk about it. So who wants to present what it is? Uh, Razor? Okay, uh, well, first he throws a ball of fire through your chest, and your heart hangs down and dangles in the hole, and you drop to your knees, and he takes one of his swords, which, by the way, where does the sword come from when he's not using ninjutsu? <laughs> but <Yeah>. anyway, <laughs> then he, he, uh, he cuts, like, through your head, like, so your face sort of slides off, and then, like, your brain slides out. <laughs> and then your tongue just sits there and wiggles. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they didn't want to show this at conventions, at least, like I said before, that it, it was leaked. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's too much for people to see right now. I mean, they, they've they done this in the past. I remember um, MK9, they didn't want to show certain things, too, I believe. But does do you think this is going to make it past the ratings board in the end, or do you think this is something that's going to be altered before the game comes out? Well, we know Australia's going to have a problem with the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, they would have anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, if if they have a problem showing it at conventions, I'm almost thinking they themselves are <laughs> doubting that this is going to make it into the final game. So. Well, it seems to me like they don't mind showing it to people in person. It's just they're not putting it in the trailers because trailers are for all audiences. Like, you can't really rate it R a trailer. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess movies can. They have red band trailers, but it seems like video games don't have that. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, the the only thing that I think would even be a question for like the uh, ratings board because they don't seem to care about violence as much as like anatomy. Yeah, it would be like the the testicles in Cassie's X-ray. Yeah, for sure. Which is also not being shown unless you've seen it leaked. So it's kind of the same along the same vein and that sense that they don't want people to see it apparently other than other than people that are there in person but all right uh any thoughts on scorpion's fatality like dislikes i think it's it, it feels disjointed it's a couple of different fatalities going on at once i'm not a fan of how the heart drops down to the hole and then nothing happens with it he just decides to cut your face off afterwards <laughs> um, he should just you know jump back throw a spear catch it Whip it back into his own fist and just crush it as his enemy watches them watches them do that and they drop to their knees and die. You know, cutting a face is nice. It's it works for him, but not after the opening, you know? Too much emphasis on fatalities these days as being kind of torture gore shows and not enough about thinking about how, how the logistics of how they should actually function and what they should be doing to kill the guy in a stylistic fashion. Again, looking at you, MK9 Jax. Yeah, and <laughs> simplicity, there's something to be said about simplicity. And when you try and go over the top, it it, it almost makes it less creepy, less um, effective in that sense that, okay, these guys are just trying, they, these guys are just spitballing ideas on what's the worst way we could kill somebody and make them, you know, really suffer. And that's not the point of a fatality. The point of the fatality is I beat you and now I'm just going to kill you. We started off in Mortal Kombat with, you know, a simple ripping their head off, t tearing their heart out, lighting them on fire. It's like now we've gotten to the point where now we got to have all three of those things in one. We got to rip their heart out, then rip their head off and then light them on fire. It's like in that order too. And that's how it tends to go. And there's no... There's no reason for that. There's no reason, like you said, why he can't just... If he wants to blow a hole through his chest and have his heart just hang down, end it on that. That's that's incredible, because that dude isn't going to survive. There's no doctor in the world that's going to repatch up that hole. He's going to die. He's going to bleed out there on the spot. So there's there's no, there's no point in cutting his face off like that. And, yeah, it's just... I agree that while it looks cool, it just doesn't make any sense because it i just see a bunch of people that are like well how do we push the envelope so let's just do all these things if you wanted to push that envelope then just leave it at one or the other 
leave it with him blowing a hole through the chest and the heart hanging down and just have cuz that's that's way more suffering than anything because then he's just literally sitting there waiting out to bleed out but it's there's no subtlety left to these things anymore and it's just yeah that 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 part frustrates me too and well, I'll say this for it at least it, at least the elements themselves look cool and it doesn't come across as completely silly like in uh deception where he rip off your leg with a spear then you'd be sitting then his enemy be sitting there hopping on one foot and rip off their arm with a spear yeah and you just kind of stroll up to them casually and break their neck i i feel like i, I heard a rim shot in the background <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, in and just, uh, I don't know why they did that i think the problem is and i'll say it like as far as like the the quick kill from the early games being better i mean I sort of like, like, in MK4 and Deadly Alliance, they started playing with camera angles and presentation more. I sort of like that, but they were still somewhat simple. Like, you'd have... Reiko would still just kick you once, and there goes your torso. And it was silly because your arms and head would spin, but it was just that one move. Yeah. And the thing... I feel like MK9, and it seems like MKX might follow, is they, they've started treating fatalities as a tech demo. Like, they're just showing off all the places a body can be sliced in, in their engine. Which makes them all sort of generic, and it sort of takes away from the character's powers. Because, like, you had an example in MK9, when it was in development, Scorpion had two finishers that both just involved cutting you up with swords. And fans complained, and they changed his second finisher to that one where he throws you through a portal, and you come out with your skin burned off, which was much cooler. Oh yeah, and that was one of my favorites in MK9, and I didn't even know about that Loved until it. I actually played the game, and I was yeah, I was blown away by that. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to see more of the um the you know the using the supernatural powers to like burn people's skin off or melt them or you know stuff like that. Yeah, there's as a lot to just the ripping and tearing and slicing. Yeah, there's a lot more creativity that can be placed into these fatalities rather than just simply. Let's find a new way to cut off their head. Let's find a new way to cut them in half. Or let's find a new way to... Well, at least in MKX's uh, game, it seems like there's a push for putting holes in people just because that's the new thing they can do. Rather than... You you don't... I don't there's not much gore tech. You have to put in a lot of creative, uh, creative other options that they could be taking. A lot more simplistic options, by the way. And I think they would get a much more favorable reception than just being like hey like i said let's just cut off their arms then cut off their head then just butcher their legs and then light them on fire so temp what do you think um disjointed is a good word i think shad was on the right track with that and like you were saying with sleeknits they don't look sleek anymore um i don't know like it Sometimes the whole Eli Roth sequence can work, but like Melina, that would make sense. If the character is truly sadistic, go for it, but there's nothing cool about inefficiency. If you're going to kill a guy, kill him, you know? And I, I mean, for a long time, for years actually, I've been slowly losing interest in fatalities. And I mean, sometimes there were some in MK9 I really liked. I really liked Sector's uh, Scarecrow fatality. I thought that was beautiful. It made yeah. sense. It was efficient. It was original. You don't see a lot of originality. I mean, granted, we've never seen anyone's face cut off. I don't believe. But why Scorpion? You know, that, that seems like a strange ceiling to break with that character. That, that should have been someone. I could see Kano doing something like that, you know. Someone who might keep a trophy, you know, might just keep that in his pocket every once in a while. That I can kind of That'd imagine. Great. Kano is the leather oh, yeah. face of Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> slices it off, catches uh, the front of the face as it falls, takes the tongue, pops it into his pocket, cracks his neck. Been a good day. Yeah, if they want to oh, be, yeah. <laughs> if they want to be shocking, like if they're going for a shock factor or the over the top factor, have just somebody cut their face off and then put it on their own face, like in a horror movie. That would be amazing. <laughs> and then just make it smile and like stick out their tongue, and that would just be creepy as all hell. And Havoc doesn't even have a face, so he could actually there do you, that. Like, there you go. You that would be wonderful. I'm if Havoc is in this game, that needs to happen. <laughs> Upside down, like well, Joker. I could see a, I could see Reptile doing it too, as like a reference to how he, you know, the human disguise. Like yeah. people have talked. How does that work? Maybe he was like wearing other people's skin. 
Oh, that would be that would be amazing. That would be cool. I would like to see that idea referenced, like in the new game, because I'm almost positive Reptile's going to be in. So yeah, I'm fairly confident of that. And or it, really, I mean, if Reptile eats human flesh, I mean, that's just a good thing to have around. You know, you could be like pork rinds. I don't, I don't know. Because <laughs> I mean, it goes back to his other fatality as well, where he's using his tongue to literally eat his opponent. So. I mean, it, it it all fits in my opinion. Cause he, yeah, he can wear the face, and then as it ends, he just starts eating it while it's on his face. Like his just tongue just starts enveloping it into his mouth. I almost kind of wanted to see one where he just like sticks out his tongue, grabs them by the ankles, and like starts swallowing them whole like a python. <laughs> yeah. and just like, like you no, know, seriously, I like distended stomach the whole nine yards, just slowly consumes them portion by portion, and then like bites at the neck. So he'll just look completely obese as he's like tr- his body's <laughs> trying to his it, digestive it kind of system. Like he's, he's just like a snake. His yeah. entire skeleton unhinges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the fatality ends with like an eighteen-hour nap as he just kind of processes all that. You know, <laughs> yeah. where is reptile? Come up there right now. His friendship is him shedding his skin and then giving it to his opponent, like as like a <laughs> as like an outfit, snake skin boots maybe. But yeah, I think we all are in agreement that it's a little bit over the top. And yeah, why would Scorp? Why why does this need to be used on Scorpion? And it yeah, just overall, it's just over the top and unhinged. It's just a little bit. I don't know. It just doesn't just doesn't make sense. I guess. So, um, any other thoughts on Scorpion's fatality? That's all I got. All right. Well, let's move on to talking about Kano. Um, any story thoughts on Kano? Or appearance thoughts or any of that? Well, we know he's uh, struck up a partnership of sorts with Quan Chi, and that will be really interesting. You have two people who are professionals at screwing other people over, so I think that's almost guaranteed to end badly. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kano always kind of gets the short end of the stick when it comes to working with other people. He's always just... Uh, just uh, a henchman basically which you know that's what he is he's kind of a henchman for hire because he just wants money and power but at the same time does he ever like come out on top on any of these he he always seems to like get ahead on things and then just get killed off by somebody that's way better than him or more powerful than him or successful than him so it'll be interesting to see what he's you or what he's doing with Quan Chi and what kind of uh, aftermath that plays out to yeah, I, I mean, feel like I feel like uh, Kano has sort of um like over the years like the reason he sort of seems to get the short end of the stick in deals and sort of end up killed off repeatedly is he's not historically a very popular character. I yeah. mean, the entire reason they left him out of Mortal Kombat 2, him and Sonya was like they checked the stats on the local arcade uh, cabinets and found that those were the two least played characters. Uh huh. And um, you know, I think that also Tobias was sort of repeatedly trying to end his uh, rivalry with Sonya so that the story could move forward, and then he just kept being brought back again and again because he is—he's sort of mid-tier popular. You know, he has fans and they are calling for him to return every once in a while. Yeah. But he's sort of the guy who's—he's not a main guy like Scorpion or Sub Zero. He's the kind of guy you can leave off of a game once in a while, and it seems like when their explanation whenever he's missing is somebody killed him and then when the game he comes back he's like no he didn't really die (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah um um... (laughs) that 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 definitely makes sense and i agree that kano's not somebody that i need to see every game i like kano he's not one of my i don't think he'd be my top 10 but maybe my top 20 and um i like to see him in the games but i agree he's not one of those people that needs to show up every single game i think he's somebody that can him sitting out one or two games is only going to make people uh like him more when he does come back i think him being in every single game would just make people lose interest that's pretty much the way i feel if he takes if he takes a holiday off once every other game then i'm fine with that but two games away i definitely start to miss the guy i've always loved him a hell of a lot yeah you guys like kano way more than i do i'm not a fan (laughs) whatsoever but uh yeah, I mean, you're right, though. Kano does have a lot of fans. A lot of people like Kano. I feel like what holds Kano back is 
he's not the favorite character of a lot of people. A lot of people don't say Kano is Mortal Kombat to me. And I mean, a lot of things I like about Kano right now didn't really surface until technology, you know, started to rise. And now he has a voice. Now he has a personality. Now he can talk and insult and argue with other characters. That is what makes the character interesting to me now. Before, I don't. I never thought he was a bad character. I, I just don't think he compared when you have an Ice Ninja and a Spectre and a Sorcerer. I, I don't think he stood out much, and it sounds like I wasn't alone in that. But Kano is all right. Um, I guess if there's any reason I'm glad to see him back is because he was a bottom five character in the last game. He had a bunch of problems, and it would be cool. It looks like he's good now. At least one of the variations looks very strong to me. I wish I I wish he had more color. I loved the red suit he had in MK9. Uh, the gray pants, the no shirt, the grayish hair. I, I'm not feeling it. I wish he had more of a... Even if it was like the white clothing from MK1. I, I think there was definitely something cool about that. I can't tell you why, but it worked for some reason. And now he looks like a generic kind of commando type. And it's not my favorite, but... It's not my character anyway. The people who like the character, I'll let them decide if it's a good design or not, you know, and I'll just kind of take it as it comes. Yeah, I, I really like his MK1 and Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 or Mortal Kombat 3 outfits the most out of... I mean, I really liked his Deadly Alliance appearance too, but I I mean, I agree that he's gone a little bit more of the generic route since then. He's kind. Of, they've kind of played up that... Uh, you know, grimy, slimy, sleazeball look, which, you know, he is, and kind of with a little bit of military in it. But I agree that something about that MK1 outfit and the Mortal Kombat 3 outfit, they just really looked really cool for him. I'm going to say that I really enjoyed the MK3 outfit. The MK1 I enjoyed for a good long while now, but I don't know. Nowadays when I look back on it, I kind of see quasi, I don't know, karate gi pajamas. I like yeah. it. It's, it's nice, but it's... They brought it back as an alternate costume. I think it was in Deadly Alliance. Yeah. And I found yeah. myself almost never using it. I, I really prefer the Deadly Alliance look from It's by far and away my favorite type. My favorite uh, look from I'm okay with how he looks here. At least, like, you know, the pants are proper camo, and he's apparently killed Su Hao or whatever and stolen his uh, cybernetic device. And uh, I like the beard pinch. Yeah, I like the beard pinch as well. I think that's a good touch. You yeah. mentioned that um, the eye segment, uh, the, the eye device actually looks a little bit more low-tech compared to previous incarnations, and I'm inclined to agree with that. I think that it could look a little bit smoother. He almost looks like he stole part of Sector or Cyrax's face and implanted it onto his own. Yeah. We don't know he didn't do that, but it's an odd look. Well, if, you, if they go with the legacy route, um, which, you know, that's a whole other uh, can of worms, but if they go the legacy route, then maybe the Black Dragon and the Tycoonin or whatever working together, maybe. Yeah, um, as far as the, or the, the costume, way, I guess. Yeah, the the costume, I I kind of like the way he looks in this game. I mean, I guess I guess my favorite past Kano look would be MK1, and like even then, I have to acknowledge Kano in a gi doesn't necessarily make any sense. True. And like, like as far as like the, like his MK9 alternate where it was like a vest and jeans and like a croc tooth necklace instead. I mean that does fit his character more, but it sort of, it bothered me to see him running around wearing that during the MK1 parts of story mode because it's sort of, like even when it comes to visuals, I'm not a big fan of retcons. Like, if a guy's costume looks like a visual update of what he wore in the old games, like uh, Johnny Cage and Raiden and Kano's primary, I like that stuff, but when you just completely change their outfit, like uh, Kano's alt and Scorpions and uh, Kitano with the bare midriff, it just it sort of creates a, a dissonance for me, where it's like, this doesn't look like the old game so i don't buy that it's a retelling of the old game you know what i mean yeah definitely so but back to his current costume i really like that uh they gave him the receding hairline again because i sort of feel like uh it gives him more character to be like going bald and yet still look like a badass and they're sort of you know 
there's an argument for you know people should have like representation like a a black guy should be able to play as a cool black guy and a, a woman should be able to play as a cool woman. And I feel like people who are going bald sometimes get the short end of the stick in the world. Because <laughs> most of the, the bald people out there in the media are sort of, you know, there's like George Costanza or even Captain Picard. You know, he seems like a, a cool guy, but nobody thinks of him as like an action hero. Well, you guys got uh, Bruce Willis and Jason Statham. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I yes, like... Kano is the Bruce Willis of Mortal Kombat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I definitely agree that his uh, eye looks lower tech, because the one he had in MK9 could, like, blink and move and look in directions. And this one's just a big, like, rectangle. Just a big lens. Yeah. And, um... The, the Sue Howe thing on his chest, I've sort of... You know, I've always wondered what the big red thing on his belt is supposed to do. Because it's always been there, but it it just like it's just like here's a big light bulb on his bandolier, <laughs> and apparently like he can like remove it now, like there's a socket on that belt he's wearing, and yeah. he just sticks yeah. it in during his intro. And I do like that it comes in other colors now because his <laughs> costume is otherwise so desaturated. Well, plus if they ever have traffic, he's just a perfect fit. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was weird that they went with the, that color scheme specifically. I like the idea of having different colors, but the red, yellow, and green, that's just... That's I just, can't see it now. That yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's just that silly. It's a big old traffic light in that world. And uh, I will say that I don't really like that he has a variation that's green. I mean, yellow is okay, but being a Cyrex guy myself, him having this glowing green light on his eye and his chest, just like, oh gosh. You just you just took Cyrax's thing. That's all he has. That's the only reason I like Cyrax is that growing green or the glowing <laughs> green light. No, I'm that's, just kidding. That's funny, <laughs> and K9's really the only time he has green lights. Like he was all kinds of multicolored in Deadly Alliance. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah. Um I I really like the way uh Kano looks and I think um, the fact that he doesn't have even grayer hair than he did before. Then again, do we really know how old he was in MK9? Did they ever say? Um, well, I can you know, look at his he's original. He's struck as being like mid to I late. I think it says like 36 or something. Like late 30s, 36? Yeah. The um, thing is, we don't know like alternate costumes might be even older versions of the true. characters because yeah. of that whole 25 years thing. Yeah, there's a lot of potential there for sure. So maybe this is just like an earlier on version of Kano, because yeah, he doesn't look very grayed out by any means, or even more bald by any means. Wouldn't that be that? That's what his alternate costume should be. He should just be completely bald. He should just <laughs> go back to that from MK1, just complete buzz cut bald, or MK3 as well. He had some hair in MK1, then he shaved it for MK3, then by yeah. the lens of his growth well, again. I think like, he's really Divisio... about of his. The the Rich Divisio sprites, his his hair was kind of like a, a stubble, but yeah. like in the like in Tobias's artwork it was like more full and Bill Murray sort of style. Uh-huh. So they basically in the later games they he yeah, was like, more what they wanted in the character. Tobias drew him in MK one the way he looks in Deadly Alliance. Yeah. But obviously Rich Divisio had his own hair hairline to deal with, so <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, so there's always potential that his alternate costume's older, or that he dies off. We don't know, but yeah. My guess would be that it, right now we're seeing the older costume, and I, the only reason I say that is because in MK9, if I remember correctly, all the primaries were from the MK3, or post-MK2 era, with Sub-Zero being uh, Kwai Liang as the primary, with Smoke being uh, sort of like the the MK3 metal padded thing going on. I think is, is is there an example I'm not thinking of, or was there a character who had their primary? I think you're more or less right. Like all the primaries were from later in story mode, and they were their alternates more towards the beginning. Yeah, even Kano being another example. MK3 Kano was the primary. Oh, no, wait, I can't think. Uh, Katana and Jade were their alternates at the end. That's right. Interesting. Um, no, I'm looking at him right now, just staring at a render of him. I mean, his his fighting variations. It's, I'm, I'm staring at his left arm, and I don't know what's going on. It looks like he might have 
couple of uh okay no never mind so i've been really looking at him the way his eye glows the way his chest glows and i'm wondering like how much of him is still human inside there i wouldn't put it past them making him more than more cybernetic than we're familiar with but just all the bulging veins on his chest and the lights uh, going on on him almost feels like he's got sort of a dc comics metallo thing going on i don't know maybe he's well yeah there's times. I feel like Kano has always, like, they've not outright said it, but, like, his eye isn't his only cyborg implant, because, like, the cannonball, for example, there's no way a normal human being can do that. <laughs> so I, I always sort of interpreted that as, like, that's whatever power his, like, muscles or, like, the augments under his skin would give him. And, like, he had, like, wires on his gloves in his MK9 outfit and stuff like that. Yeah, he is a bit of a tech fetish. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the type of guy that cuts off his own legs because he's into that type of thing and then replaces them with cybernetic ones. Sorry, that was just completely unrelated. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I guess I agree. Uh, they, they never, I mean... Up a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> he gets a little freaky after he has a few. I don't know. In story mode, there's no event that would shed light on that, you know? There's nothing... There's no point in the plot where he has to repair something or we get to see further cybernetics. Kano's always kind of in the background, so it's hard to... Well, yeah, that's, well it's even for the characters who were in the foreground, like, their origin stories weren't really covered in story mode. And there's there's all kinds of stuff in the bios that never even comes up in the cutscenes, like the whole thing about Sonya joined her army because of her dead dad, or um, Luke Kang's Smoke's whole and Enra backstory... Yeah. And that's on the subject of that, like, I'm sort of worried. The thing that worries me about uh, MKX's story mode is MK9 covered three games in two hours. And as a result, all the characters are sort of less developed than they were in the original MK1 through 3. Yep. We're now doing 25 years in two hours of cutscenes, so kind of concerned. <laughs> Yeah, fingers crossed for sure, because I don't... I mean, I'm hoping that it's a longer story mode. I hope they have more to work with because of how much MK9 sold. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say at this point. I I'm just hoping. Er pretty much everything on MK10 or MKX, I'm just kind of hoping, because I'm still kind of in the middle on this game as a whole. I think it's going to be great from a gameplay perspective, but... You really just never know with Mortal Kombat. The things that happened in MK9, I could not have seen coming. No way. All right, well, uh, any other thoughts on Kano's appearance, or do you want to move on to gameplay? I think he should ditch the suspenders. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what are you guys' thoughts on Kano's gameplay? Let's see. He's got uh, Cutthroat, Commando, and Cybernetic. And I'm going to say off the bat that I I think that commando is the route that I'm going to go through with. Not because I enjoy the word commando or want to picture Kano going commando, but <laughs> um, because I really liked the 3D era's vision of Kano as kind of a close range grappler. I thought that that was a natural evolution for him. I really enjoyed it. For me, it's going to be either between commando or cybernetic because I like my distance projectiles. And Lord knows I love using his eye laser whenever I get the chance. Not too keen on cutthroat. Power ups. Not my thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I sort of agree. I like um, I like command grab characters, so uh, Commando looks pretty good. But I'm really excited that he's got his eye lasers back. So I'll probably play Cybernetic a lot because I was bummed out that he didn't have a laser in MK9. Yeah, I think I'm digging Commando the most. Um, I usually don't play those types of characters, but I think they have such interesting gameplay to see and to watch. So when you actually can pull it off. It definitely looks very, very impressive. So I really like Commando the most so far from what I've seen from him. I don't know. Right now, I'm going to say Cutthroat because I really like the metagame of the power-ups because once you do that power-up, it changes the way your opponent thinks. It, it changes their idea of risk-reward. So I don't know. I, I kind of like that psychological element. And I do like to fight close. The problem with grabs is... I mean, typically in fighting games, if you do a neutral jump, grabs will whiff. And that, I don't like that 50-50 setup. I try to avoid Yomi or just general guessing as much as I can. I like to play very safe, offensive gameplay. 
Uh, and that's why grapplers have never really been my thing. Well, we'll see though. I mean, if you can, I mean, you can combo into grabs with Shiva, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, if it's the same thing, I might go that route as well. Then I might do the whole commando thing, but I'm probably going to stick with cutthroat just to see how it affects the meta game. Interesting. Um, any thoughts on his gameplay other than that, or do you want to move on to his fatality? All right. I think, well, I think, yeah, I think I've said my piece on his yeah. uh, gameplay. Pretty much straightforward. Um, his fatality wise, uh, we we first saw that he essentially, um, he well, what we saw initially in the teaser was he goes behind his opponent and then he blows a hole in there face and his eye is showing but as we later learned he also guts his opponent first and their innards spill out onto the ground and then he goes behind him and essentially blows a hole through their eye so his glowing eye is showing what are your guys thoughts slightly disjointed but not to the effect that scorpions as i find i can see him doing both of these things I don't mind it so much. I especially, I'm, I'm a big fan of seeing his glowing eye through his opponent's, like, blown up head. Yeah, I don't... Probably, probably one of my preferred ones that we've seen so far of any count. Yeah, I don't mind it so much on Kano, just because Kano is such a dirty little bastard that he would just straight up gut his opponent and then make them stand there and suffer while their innards are falling out and then, you know, blow their head open and just do something weird and creepy and crazy like that. And he'd probably laugh about it and then spit it's on like, him afterwards. But that's just, that's my envision of Kano. If there is one character in Mortal Kombat that I can think of that would do something just, just completely disrespectful like that. It's, it's Kano. So I, I don't mind it as much. It still is on the verge of being over the top. Like he could have just done one or the other and I would have been perfectly happy with it and thought it would be a really fantastic fatality. But Eh, I think both is just barely acceptable in this situation for me. I like the thought that he would want the last thing that his enemy sees to be their own guts spilling out onto the floor before everything goes black. It, it works for him. And it sends yeah. a message, too, you know? I mean, when people find that corpse, they're like, oh, well, fucking Kano again. Yeah, so. <laughs> Damn it. They're missing <laughs> their guts, and I'll ch check someone to see if they're... Let's look at the janitor. Yeah, they see their guts on the floor. Don't don't tell me their eyes blown out. Ah, oh, damn it. it. Their eyes are blown out. It's Kano. Son of a bitch. Do Son I of a bitch, Kano. Ah, crap. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it does uh, fit Kano really well. Like, the, the doing two... Fatalities in one in his, in his instance doesn't bother me. I think he is the kind of guy who would go for that. And I also really like that uh, it involves disembowelment because that's something we usually never see with fatalities. Like Cabal had one with intestines in it in MK9, but other than that, the gut spilling out thing really hasn't been done much. Yeah, I, that's that's one thing that I've uh, mentioned in the past that uh, I, I really like the idea of more other than like the heart and the brain to some extent they really haven't played too much with like you know doing the lungs or the stomach etc cetera, etc cetera. like I, I really like reptiles where he vomits in their throat and then pulls out their stomach and it's just filled with acid like that that was really effective because we never seen anything like that so i think him basically just cutting across their stomach as their you know intestines come out that's that's something i've been waiting for so i, I think it's really fitting for him and it looks good, too. Uh, with Cabal's intestine fatality with the entrails, I don't think that looked good. It looked, graphically, it it didn't really, it's hard to explain, but it just, it looked yeah, bad, it was, to be honest with you. It was too, um, it wasn't messy enough, yeah, I think. Yeah, I was thinking the same Precisely. thing. It, it was too clean. Like, if if that really happened, it wouldn't just be this little, you know, string up like that. I've always wanted to see one where he just kind of digs his hook sword in, wraps the intestine around it, like zips off the screen like Flash and comes back on the other side, wraps it around their neck and kicks them in the back <laughs> really hard, snaps their neck with their own intestines. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I thought you were just going to say he wraps the hook sword around it and just takes off. <laughs> you just see it unravel really quickly and then just snap out. Hey, guys, call me. Come yeah. on. Let's brainstorm here. You see their stomach and their esophagus and everything just rip out with it. That would, that would be insane. Just dig in and spool it around like spaghetti on a fork. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Any other thoughts on the fatality? It's an it's a exaggerated sequence, I guess, but it feels more compact to me. Scorpions does not feel compact. There's a lot going on in Canis Fatality, but because it's all kind of it flows together, I'm okay with it. I like it. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, well, let's move on to Raiden. Uh, uh, he's definitely, in my opinion, much better looking in this game. He uses his lightning a ton more, and he comes off more powerful and uh, just overall more of like a god than he ever has before. And he just his gameplay in general has looked better than ever before but before we get into gameplay let's talk about his story potential because mk9 uh raiden not so popular so you want to start us off with that razor yeah the uh the god of blunder <laughs> um <laughs> so basically uh i almost want to call what mortal kombat 9 how he comes out looking at the end as character assassination because they sort of, you know, they took a guy who's known for, you know, having been around for eons and being this wise mentor guy, and we sort of watch him accidentally get, like, his entire team killed and start, like, breaking down and losing his mind over it, to the point where, like, he accidentally kills Liu Kang. Like, you can see on his face, he clearly did not mean that shot to be lethal. And it's like, how does a guy made of lightning <laughs> mess up shooting lightning? How are you not the expert of electricity? <laughs> it's literally all he does. Like, like yeah. why is charging at you? Why do you not just teleport right behind him and knock him out in the back with a neck shot or something? Yeah, right? No, it's stop not even like me electrocuting you. It's almost like he put out his hands to, like, slap him away, like, eh, no, please don't, and then lightning came out. Oh, crap, I forgot I can do that. I'm shocking you this hard to protect you. <laughs> Shocks of love. Yeah, but, I mean, at the end, he kind of did save the realms. Like, Shao Kahn is dead, I guess? But, it's like... That's not even... That doesn't even prevent Armageddon, right? It just prevents Khan from winning. Like, Blaze could still summon the pyramid. The The only thing that could really stop Armageddon is either you kill Blaze before it happens, or you just never let him get free from guarding that egg, which means, you know, not letting Onaga come back. But Raiden doesn't even know about, like, Shujinko and the Kamidogus and Onaga and Blaze. Yeah, you'd so think it, he would uh, have chosen a less of a vague statement to, you know, kind of help him out a bit more on what to do to save the, you know, the whole realm. Yeah. Other than he must not win or whatever the hell it was that he... It, he must win. <laughs> yeah, he must win. I'm going to tell you who the he is. <laughs> it's got to be me! Me, Kung Lao! Nope. <laughs> I'm going like might how... be worse now, for all we know. Yeah. If he had said Khan must win, then Raiden would have, like, let them win the tournament, and that would have not been good. But, like, why didn't he just send the message to MK3 instead of to MK1? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So S Silly Raiden. <laughs> we all have our bad days. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I do like that, like, characters are acknowledging in their, like, fight quotes with Raiden that, like, they don't trust him or don't want to be protected by him. Yeah. Sub-Zero says Earth needs a better protector. Ouch. When a total asshole like that says you're not doing your job, protecting a world probably he doesn't give much of a shit about. Yeah. Ooh. Raiden still has feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Arf, Sub-Zero. Arf. <laughs> yeah, so, going into MKX, like, I'm I'm wondering two things, basically. Uh, one, is Raiden still at all mentally disturbed? Because he was really, you know, stressing out and losing it towards the end there with, like, when they stopped the Soul Nato, but his amulet still cracked. He was all, like, kind of threw a tantrum almost, and he was, like, not paying attention in the middle of conversations, and he was getting really panicky. And may maybe he's recovered some since, you know, it all worked out, at least from his perspective. Yeah. But I gotta wonder, like, that doesn't really show me that this guy is leadership material, if that's how he reacts to stress. 
found that entire portion when he was with the Netherrealm practically begging for Quan Chi's help painful to watch. I can't go back and watch that. <laughs> Pity that guy. It's not the Raiden I know. It's Nothing about that scene works anyway. That whole scene is just a oh, clusterfuck. Yeah, it's, it's evil. He's he's doing something that only like Dark Raiden from Deception would have thought of. All right. Well, any uh... you don't these people trust you. You don't sell their <laughs> immortal souls to the devil. <laughs> no, that's what everybody should do. You gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, yeah. Raiden gets know, Raiden gets his I hands had, dirty. Eternity of torment as long as Earth is safe. I had blocked out the part where he so, tried to sell their souls. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> So yeah, the the other thing I wonder is, will there be any kind of karma where like he actually gets punished for his screw ups, or like he's it is determined that he's not good enough anymore, and like Fujin replaces him like an MK4 or something like that. I think we're all thinking Fujin. It'd, be, it'd, it'd really be nice if he just stepped down or was demoted or depowered and. Give Fujin a good reason to really come back and kick a little bit of ass, like so many people have been wanting. F- Fujin's got Fujin's got his fans. Yeah, Fu- Fujin's very popular, and I think I, I kind of think neither Realm doesn't uh, realize it because they've left him out of games that he really should have been in in the past. Like in Deadly Alliance and Deception, there's really no excuse for the Protector of Earthrealm to not be there. Yeah, and. I think they just look at Fujin and they're like, well, we didn't really like his moves. He plays too much like Kung Lao and the crossbow doesn't make sense and all that stuff. And so that's why they leave. I I really like Fujin and I think a lot of other people do too. I think he has a lot of potential and I think now that they've had a lot of time to think about it and their quality of games has uh, increased drastically, I feel like, since the 3D games, I think in a 2D environment, I, I think Fujin's really going to shine if they bring him back. Well, we know that he was considered for MK9, don't we? At least, was there, was there that, that voice sample, Fujin, that was found in the, was uh, the demo of the core game? It might have been just like a, an Easter egg to mess with people's heads. Yeah. I, put I mean, the, he does show up in like a Kratos' ending, but other than that, there's really, I'm not sure any place where he would fit in to MK9 since it's a retelling of 1 through 3. I don't acknowledge anything that's not part of pure MK, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd take those those boss bios that we found from the uh, from the MK9 demo as being a little bit of background canon. For God's sake, Kintaro needed something. He really did. Uh, that, that poor guy. Um, Alright, well, what do you guys think of uh, Raiden's gameplay... Well, I am enamored with Stormlord Raiden. I love the idea of lightning traps. All the gameplay footage I've seen looks terrifying. I'm going to dread playing this guy online. I really am. Stormlord is probably going to be uh, where my heart lies. Displacer Raiden, always fun. I love teleports. I can never really teleport properly to save my life, which is probably why I'm sticking with Stormlord. <laughs> but um, I, again, I'll just say diagonal Superman torpedoes. I can't believe I live in a world where this is happening. That's amazing to me. He realized he could fly everywhere, <laughs> not just back and forward. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, I think developing injustice, like you know, when they were just making MK games, they were just you know each new iteration they'd come up with moves based on the moves they had in the previous game. Whereas developing for superheroes who have this wide array of powers from the comics, you can do anything. Just, you know, coming up with moves based on that sort of opened their mind to the possibilities. And I think that um, all three of Raiden's variations look absolutely nuts to me. Like, this is, you know, far and away the best he's ever looked. He's usually kind of boring, right? Definitely. Very much so. I really didn't care for Raiden in the previous games. Yeah, and he's kind of always had the same tricks up his sleeve for... Almost since MK1 or MK2, he hasn't had a lot of expansion in terms of his abilities. He's always had his torpedo and his electricity and his teleport. And then he, you know, he's got his uh, electrocution, etc., etc. But he hasn't, they haven't really given him any, like, new tools to play with. Like, they have a lot of the other fighters to really change up his gameplay and potentials and how he's played. And I think this is the most drastic change we've seen of him yet. In a good way. Yeah. Lightning shot they gave him in trilogy, I think it was. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. I, 
I would like to see some variation of that come back. Backwards lightning electrocution. Well, he had that, it was sort of his, um, in his EX yeah. bolt in MK9 did that, mm. yeah. But, um, like, I will say, I'm sort of, I wish that they put his uh, quarterstaff in the games more often. Like, I sort of feel like that's sort of like a character item, like it's part of his personality to me, that he carries around that big walking stick, and it was even, like, in MK4, almost relevant to the plot where he gave it to Kai, even though he had it right back in the next game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, you remember that uh, staff I gave, uh, gave you? Yeah, I'm going to need that back. And we I never saw him Kai in like two <laughs> weeks, but, uh... <laughs> Look, you're not going to be in the game, and I am, so hand Look, it over. you didn't say no take backsies, so... I'm going to need it back. But Probably yeah, never gave him back his hammer. <laughs> just, it did. It did not work for him. He may as well just I, stolen it from Thor, pretty much. Now the yeah, staff. Well, I kind of like it because force. of the Thor angle, like because Raiden is supposed to be like every Thunder God in mythology is like just those guys met Raiden and this is their interpretation of him. Yeah, he's the Shujinko of the Thunder Gods. In so, so many like, ways, he, he probably like he was worshipped by the Greeks as Zeus and the Norse as Thor, and like Nightwolf calls him Heioka, which is like the his tribe's name for the Spirit of Lightning or whatever. But, yeah, like, as far as his moves go, like, he looks insane, and especially, like, graphically, the way the lightning bolts shoot out now is so much better than, like, they look like sort of piddly balls in previous games and stuff like that. Yeah. And, like, I, I especially love his, uh, his throw where he, like, grabs him by the neck and slams him down and then just blasts them on as they're on the ground and then, like, the lightning webs out in a big cone. For sure, yeah. That, that, just everything about um, his gameplay this time around is just really intriguing. Like you said, uh, the lightning traps are really interesting because that's really going to change up how he's played and how he manages the, uh, the battlefield, so to speak, and just how he makes his... He's going to basically set up his opponent to have to move and he has so many techniques from previous games between his teleport his torpedo and his electricity projectile that forcing his opponent to move like that and you know controlling the stage or the battlefield that's that's gonna i feel like that's gonna really give him a lot to play with and really change up his gameplay in a good way and i'm really excited for the the electricity traps and um, the teleport variation. I forget which one that one's called. Displacer. Displacer. That Both of those are what I find most intriguing because they just look like a lot of fun. But I agree with Shadowloo that I'm going to get my ass kicked a lot by Raiden players that do really well with those types of uh, techniques at their disposal. I, have, I think it's I too much, really. About, um, I have concerns about uh, Stormlord, the, the trap setups. It seems like they take some time, so if, like, you're on the end of a lot of pressure. I don't know if you'll ever be able to get them out. Yeah, he's definitely... It, those Those things are definitely going to be... If you can bully your opponent that with those and keep and, keep and maintain control, then you're going to be in good shape. But as soon as you're, you know, fighting defensively and trying to make a comeback in that regard, those, yeah, those aren't going to be very good for you. <laughs> Characters like Ermac or Kung Lao, they're going to be able to shut that down really fast, so I worry that he's not going to get that traction. But at the same time, I'm kind of worried Raid is going to be broken as well. I'm, I don't... Too much. Yeah, too much, because in the last game, Raiden was a big problem in the beginning. He, he wasn't so good by the end, but that teleport was godlike, and they eventually did nerf it, <laughs> but that was ridiculous. I hated that fucking teleport so much. Online especially, because the online was so bad for MK9. So that teleport was like, you know, free combo. I just, I couldn't stand it. And yeah, I don't know. Any character that controls space, the way Raiden controls space worries me. But you are you guys are right, though, because a lot of characters, they shut down footsies, they shut down setups, and they do it from a distance. Like, like I said, Kung Lao is probably not going to be in the game. Uh, Ermac, who probably is going to be in the game. A uh, Reptile, with that dash, if he whips that, he's right in your grill. He's right fucking there, so... We'll see. I don't know. I mean, I want it to be good. I want every character to be good, but yeah, NRS's track record isn't so great when it comes to balancing, at least in the beginning. 
All right, well, that does it for uh, Raiden's gameplay. Does anybody have any thoughts on just anything else regarding that before we move on to his fatality? Uh, just the lightning effects, really. The lightning effects look unbelievable in this game. And in the previous games, Raiden was always lackluster graphically. Uh, the torpedo always looked awkward. Now it looks really good. Now it looks like he's, he's someone who can fly and is charging into you. I never got that vibe from the previous games. He always did this rigid torpedo stance and now it looks good. The lighting effects look really good. He looks like a thunder god. He has the big trouble in little China thing going yeah. in a way he never did before. I love it. Yeah, That's I, what every character needs to look like in my opinion. Agreed. And yeah, the, the lightning effects in general, just throughout his combos and his specials and like you said, how the torpedo works, everything just looks phenomenal in this game. I think it part of it has to do with the, you know, jumping to the current gen uh obviously gives him a lot more capabilities in that regards but yeah he just he's never looked better in that department so completely agreed there i'm not uh entirely sold on the stormlord variation lightning effect on his hat like uh graphic wise they're basically defined by thunder god variation it's i think it's mostly his hands that, that are blazing with lightning this place where it's kind of all around him i think and stormlord it's it's, it's mainly his hat i don't know I think they could have shifted that, shifted that to his eyes a little bit. Just to see his eyes blazing with lightning a lot more would be really impressive. That's an effect you get a lot from him in a lot of the, uh, a lot of comics and, and visuals from him. Lightning eyes. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, well, moving on to his fatality. We got to see his fatality. Temp, do you want to basically break it down for us? Um, Basically, it's a... Uh... God, it's actually been a while <laughs> since I've seen it. Shadaloo, go ahead. Do your thing, man. <laughs> Uh, geez. Have we seen the whole thing, actually? Everything? I think we've just seen... Because we saw an updated x-ray, but I think as far I think as... I watched it once. I, I remember... I know he's got a bit where, like, he just electrocutes each side of your head and your eyeballs kind of pop they out. pop out, sucks. and then I think he electrocutes your head and it explodes, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the head pops off, right? Yeah. And then he shoots it out of the air? Yeah, I'm pretty sure... Explodes? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it... Sh it goes up into the air after your eyes pop out, and then I think he electrocutes the head in air and it explodes. Does that sound right? Here, I'm sure going to look at it right now. Okay, oh. because I could have sworn that's what happens. But regardless, we can just discuss just the element that we do know for sure, and that's he electrocutes you, and it leads to you just the, the opponent on their knees and yeah. their, <clears throat> their head. the head, charges up, eyeballs out of their sockets, uh, head flies up, and he blows up the head. Okay. You know what? It's really stylish. I like it a lot. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it screams Raiden, obviously. I mean, it's kind of what we've seen from him before with the whole, obviously, he's going to use his electricity as we expect, so you can't really fault him there. And then the eyeballs popping out is a great visual for him, even though that's just kind of creepy, and I don't think about Raiden <laughs> when I think of making his eyeballs, or his opponent's eyeballs pop out. That's kind of creepy and vicious but you know that's just a side effect of the electricity is what we're led to believe so i mean i've never seen a guy electrified so i can't speak to whether that's uh i think when someone is <laughs> actually electrified like that like in electric chair executions i know i'm pretty sure that the, the, they wrap a, a blindfold around you uh -huh. because your eyes do tend to burst yeah if i if i remember hearing right i'm i'm no anatomy or or method of execution expert you know, okay so it's something that could likely happen so that that to me is a really cool effect and i don't get where the head pops off though that's kind of weird that that kind of harkens back to the fact that he can just like electrocute your arms off which i don't electricity <laughs> isn't when he does it there's kind of like a burst yeah. of like love electricity at the neck that like shoots okay. it up straight up uh, off and yeah there's like a trail of shock waves or something <laughs> so it's like a it's like a bottle rocket it's just like pew. Yeah. it almost reminds me of like a callback to his original mk1 one where he'd blow up the head yeah which i guess is all right i mean personally i always like the super nintendo version of his mk1 finisher better because i thought like the turning him to dust was more creative yeah with the skull on top of the little pile of ashes Agreed. i, I definitely yeah. love that i think that was yeah. uh, an instance where the censorship definitely worked in uh, its favor for sure and all the really all of them looked better in my opinion except for maybe the head rip but yeah you, like for the super nintendo fatalities i love the ice shatter i love the kick through the stomach i thought all that was really tight yeah it's, it's except for kano kano just kind of 
pulled a sweaty yeah. hair out of your chest. <laughs> yeah, it's the same kind of it's the same kind of thing. What we've been talking about throughout all these fatalities is that sometimes they rely too much on just the gore factor, and it kind of the creativity kind of takes a back seat. But when they don't have that gore available to them as an option, they had to be more creative, and it worked out well for them. So you don't always need to have extreme amounts of blood or gore just you know, ridiculous things just happening just to shock people. Sometimes just, you know, simply electrocuting somebody to dust with their skull laying on top is effective enough. But yeah, I, I agree completely on there. Um, so overall thoughts on this fatality? Do you like the fact that the head pops up in the air, the eyeballs pop out, and he electrocutes the head after it's already decapitated? Or does that harken back to the fact that why would he electrocute the head out of the air? It's just the length, really. It just goes on a little too long for me. Like, if I was playing a serious match, I, I would hate, I'd be looking at my watch like halfway through. It's a little bit lengthy for me. And uh, honestly, if I have three bars of meter, I'm just going to do an x-ray. I think it looks a thousand <laughs> times cooler. So, yeah, but it's, it's not bad. I'm, I'm a fan. I like it. I like it more than, I think, Kano's or Scorpion's. A little uh, effect there is that, like, right after he starts grabbing you and shocking your skull, it's he brings you down to your knees. Yeah, you I know? like that part. And, like, it's this almost... is what you get for screwing with a god. Yeah, it's almost, your head. it's almost like Zod, bow, you know, bow yeah. at my knees type of thing. I like it. Yeah. Or kneel before I, I Zod. Like it too. <laughs> I think, um, I agree with Temp that it is a little too long. Like, I feel like if he grabbed the head dropped them to their knees, the eyeballs popped out, and he just kept shocking until the head exploded. That would be enough. The, the shooting it into the air thing is kind of a little much, but overall, I really like it. I especially like the eyes popping out. Yeah, I I think I, I agree with that sentiment. I think he should have just grabbed onto them, shocked them, they, they fall to their knees, he keeps shocking them, their eyeballs pop out, and then their head explodes like a second later. So it's just kind of like... No, I'm sorry, go on. No, I was just saying that that would be the, the head popping into the air part and then him shocking that is what does it. Like, that's where it becomes too much and too long. He could have just electrocuted them on their knees, electrocuted them, and then eyeballs pop out and then instantaneously their head explodes like a second or two later. Would have been enough for me. I will take it over the days of deception where he blew himself up for seemingly no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I... I'm sure they were just trying to reference the uh, the opening, but the the way that looked was so stupid. There was like a channel of lightning between him and the guy. Like the explosion didn't look like an explosion. It looked like he just fell to pieces. <laughs> Take this. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they want to go for nostalgia, what would be just perfection to me is if after, it doesn't even really matter what the fatality is, after the corpse is bloody and on the ground, he just walks away and says, have a nice day. That I'd be perfection for me. I, I, I love that. I, I do miss the the have a nice days because like Shang had it in his MK2 ending too. Yeah. Holy shit! I didn't know that. Well, I guess I forgot about that because I did I did beat the game with Shang, but that's actually pretty sick. Yeah, yeah. Like his ending is like he takes over the world, and there's a picture of him with all the shadow priests like worshiping him or something like that, and it's like Shang, you know, Shang killed Khan, then Shang conquered Earth. Have a nice day. I remember the picture. That was actually a really good ending artwork. I do remember that. Yeah. I remember actually going through the MK3 endings one by one and hoping to see which person had the have a nice day thing. Cause I thought it was going to be kind of a tradition. And when it ended after MK2, I was a little bit sad. Yeah. All right. Well, that probably wraps it up for Raiden. Uh, let's move on to last but not least Quan Chi, the last revealed character. Um, well, well I, we do know Goro's coming back, true. but all we have is what he looks like. Yeah. Well true. sculpted shoulders for Goro. <laughs> <laughs> he looks he looks like the the animatronic from the movie. Yeah, he does. I I definitely think he looks really cool. I think uh the movie was Goro's crowning moment of awesome, as they say. Especially yeah, when down he... to the, the dignified speech. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He's insulting Kano for being a slob. That's the best. Mm. Um, How lucky for them. <laughs> Back home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really digging Quan Chi's appearance in this game. Uh, I really like his new outfit. It's it's about time he got a new outfit, and I really like the kind of Cenobite from Hellraiser kind of uh, inspiration it looked like it came from. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm liking the way Quan Chi looks so far in this game. How about you guys? Uh, I, am... I, I really I really dig it. I sort of, I miss the, the teal. Like, he, it's all black now. And yeah. um, I sort of, I like, like, my, my favorite Quan Chi costume so far has always been the Mortal Kombat 4 one with the big puffy sleeves and stuff. And, like, this one is really good. And it might actually become my favorite over time as I get used to it. I just, I just sort of miss the, the bit of teal color. Like, I feel like it, they could have put it in his pants or somewhere. <laughs> maybe, maybe in his alt costume, I don't know. But, yeah, I, I really like this one. It, it sort of reminds me a lot of, like, the the armor he wore in MK4 over the shirt. Yeah. But, like, just that. Like, he's not wearing the shirt underneath. No. I will say that it's, it's definitely long past time that Quan Chi has had something new to wear. I think we're all sick of that... Uh shirtless deadly alliance to get up there he was running for so very long which is good for its time but you know and again yeah, in, in a series where people are just known for changing their wardrobes all the time to have him in that for so long is just was weird yeah he he wore it for like a whole decade which is at least as long if not longer as Liu kang had been wearing the striped pants and headband mm. yeah i'm definitely a fan of his new getup it's it works wonderfully for him i do miss the teal I am not entirely yet sold on like the bat collar. He kind of reminds me of like I don't know, like Hordak from Masters of the Universe a little bit. But <laughs> that aside, I don't know. I, I I really think it's a great look for him. It's good. How about you, Temp? Any thoughts on him? Uh, not so much on his appearance. Uh, it looks good. It looks way better. Uh, I actually initially, I think most of us really did like the Deadly Alliance costume at first because it was. Such a drastic change. All the characters in that game looked drastically different for the most part. Um, but you're right, 10 years of that shit, I don't know. I, I think we were all sick of it, especially in the light of, you know, God of War eventually coming out and just pale and bald was getting tired on every end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think another thing that did it was just, like, he was wearing it in games where, like, the tattoos and the amulet didn't make sense for him to have because there were there's exactly. supposed to be, like, story behind those things. Yeah. Well, let's not talk about Shaolin modes. <laughs> um one interesting point is do you guys like the way variations change somebody's attire as in i think a prime example is quan chi goes from either he has glowing green skeleton hands or arms on his back with the glowing green skull on his front which i like the skull by the way and uh to on his other variation he has his tattoos glow uh bluish purple and the last one is his color glows red and his eyes glow red. Do you guys like that type of thing? Or do you think they should find a more subtle way to represent variations, either by a symbol under the life bar or just, I mean, other costume elements could be uh, implemented to show that they have a different variation or they're using a different variation. But glowing colors for me just kind of, I don't know, I don't, I don't care for that so much. I wasn't against I... it at first, but right now, you're right. It's not looking terribly good, in my opinion. I'm at the point where I'd rather them just have, like, something under the life bar, saying what variation they are, because, like, even when it's subtle, it doesn't look good to me. Like, the Grandmaster costume, that medallion looks fucking weak as hell. I don't, I don't like looking at it, you know? And uh, with Quan Chi, with the contrast on the uh, the Summoner costume, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't gel for me. So, yeah, I'm not against it in concept. Like, if they can make it look good, and they can make it look good across all concepts, that's, that, or all costumes, then yeah, that, that's good. But that's also huge. You can't mess that up. See, that's, Grandmaster has to look good in all costumes. See, that's the key, though, is with Quan Chi, isn't, aren't his, uh, in this game, I know they were in the previous games, but aren't his uh, tattoos red? Or are they black I think in this so. game? They're, they're always they're red. red, and then they glow purple in the one where they glow. Okay, and that's my problem. Why would they glow purple? Why not just glow red if you're going to make something glow, which I don't understand why they glow, but if they're going to glow, why not glow the color that they're glow or they naturally are? It doesn't make any sense for them to just randomly glow a completely different color. Same with his collar. He has a, he has a black, you know, giant spikes on his collar on the side of his head, and they glow red for some reason. Why? It just doesn't make any sense and the skeleton hands and all that stuff like the the skeleton ones don't bother me so much because you know he's 
that's his thing. He throws green skulls and stuff like that. So that at least makes a bit more sense. So that doesn't bother me as much. But glowing purple tattoos and a glowing red collar, that bothers me. Just like, you know, uh, mentioned the Sub-Zero's mask earlier. I don't care so much for the glo the ice mask, so to speak, just because it just stands out way too much. It throws the costume. Like, that's that's my thing. I'm an art major, so these are the kind of things that bother me when... When I feel like a costume looks really cool the way it is, when you make something glow, it completely changes the way the costume aesthetic comes across, and it just can it can make a good costume an okay costume or a bad costume. It just it just does not work for me. I think they should find a, a subtler way to represent these, be a symbol or just smaller things on the costume to like not all of them are bad. Like you said, the there's certain things that are subtle enough that you're like okay that doesn't disrupt the costume or ruin it, but other things like that, like the glowing and stuff like that, just bother me. Raiden's yeah. electric hat. Yeah. I think um, I think it depends on the character, because, like, there are some, like, if you look at Scorpion's three, they're all pretty subtle. Like, it goes from swords on his back, or his hands are on fire, or he's got that summoning thing on his belt. Yeah. And that works. And I think, I, I actually kind of like the glowing tattoos on Quan Chi, or the, the glowing uh, spikes on his collar. Like I like I like that the spikes glow red because it sort of looks like they're like molten hot. Mm -hmm. Like I think I think they could adjust it more so it would look uh, more like like less just bright red glow and more of that. Like if it did look just straight up molten hot, if that was obviously what they were going for, it would probably work even better. As it is, it but looks like, kind of neon. I think yeah, that's what yeah. Comes. But, like, on Sub-Zero, I mean, he's got... In Cryomancer, he's got the blue arms from Deadly Alliance. And that works well. Yeah. But, yeah, the, the mask in Unbreakable and the, the medallion in Grandmaster, they're too bright. They draw your eye too much. They don't go with the costume. They clash. Like, I don't know. It just... Stuff like that. And and Kano's another issue. Like, I know you, you said you like the lights. Um, I like the red light. And I always... See, the problem with Mortal Kombat unlike Street Fighter, is you associate certain colors with certain fighters. You know, you know, Ryu can wear whatever gi he wants. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter because he still looks the same to, you know, his fans. But when you take Kano, who's notorious for, you know, a, a half his face or whatever implant on his eye where the eye is red, when you change it to green or yellow, it just, it does, it just, it, that's weird to me. It's just a minor nitpick. It's nothing that's like, uh, this game's 7 out of 10 because I don't like Kano's color on his eye or any ridiculous things like that, but it's just that's the kind of things that bother me because I don't want to see, even though I made a joke about the fact that, you know, I like Cyrex because he has glowing green, which, you know, that's that's not true, but the point is, <laughs> the fact is that Kano has that glowing green eye and that just throws me off because it's like I associate him with having a glowing red eye, so I don't know. It's just a little minor well, tangent. My My... Like, my approach with costumes is, I mean, I sort of agree that, like, when a character has a color scheme, you should sort of stick to that, yeah. because that's what's iconic about them. But I think there's also an element where it's, like, a costume should tell a story, too. And I wonder if, like, Kano's that, you know, his chest thing is, like, a plot device, and, like, because, you know, he can take it out and put it in, and if that's the power source for his eye or whatever, and he has more than one of them, and they each do a different thing, maybe, like, the green could stand for radioactive or something like that, who knows? Or maybe he's just, like, a girl who needs different types of shoes, who wants different <laughs> types of colors. Yeah, it's also possible. <laughs> well, I mean, just, like, in other examples is, like, Devorah. Uh, I know one of her, you know, she normally has her hood up, but one of her variations is her hood is down, and it's, like, I, I like, that's a subtle difference. You know, I'm going to look at the other player, and I'm going to know exactly what they're playing, it's hood versus no hood, or and whatever her third one was. That's a noticeable. I think her third one, she's like surrounded by bugs, like uh, Draman or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and that and that's fine. I th I feel like those are all three of those are perfectly acceptable, perfectly subtle in my eyes. Whereas red tattoos, glowing purple, which you know, if there's a if it makes sense for whatever reason, fine. But I don't know, and I have no pro. I like the way Quan Chi looks with the purple. It just to me, it just doesn't make sense for Quan Chi and I just don't like glowing things because then my eyes it, it I don't know it just detracts from the costume in my opinion but that's I think that uh <laughs> should we come across a scenario where Ermac is in the game he should probably glow from different places Ermac's all about the glowing sections yeah hands eyes perhaps 
I'm also hoping that if smoke winds up in, he just more basically emits smoke from different places, his mouth or his hands or a general mist around him. I don't know. So it's not his ass, but whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, there's there's some of that already, like Scorpion with the fiery hands. or I mean, all of Raiden's variations are just lightning on different parts of him. Yeah. Well, that was my rant. Um, any other thoughts on Quan Chi's appearance? Do you guys like the skull? Uh, I wonder, like, there's a lot of speculation that the skull has, like, a meaning. Like, it's actually somebody's skull. Like, he killed a character and their yeah. head is a power source for him or something. Uh -huh. If it is, and, smart money says Shinnok. I, I, I don't not. know how much Hopefully I not. believe that. I think it might just be decoration, but at the same time, it is really weird to wear a skull on your shirt, like but an actual human skull. He's also got the money sticking too. out. To be fair, though, uh, we talked earlier about how their primary outfits can come from later parts of the game. It's very possible that it is Shinnok's skull, but that doesn't mean he's not in the game. It just means he kills him at yeah. some point in the story, which would not yeah, be that's... unbelievable. That's sort yeah. of one of the big mysteries about going into this. Who is the boss? Is there more than one villain? Because, like, 25 years, long time to cover a lot of ground, and we already know that some of that ground is about Kotal Kahn gaining and then losing the throne of Outworld. So it's like, how much is Shinnok and the MK4 retelling going to be in there? Because that's how MK9 ended, but yeah, it's like, maybe maybe there's, like, three different bad guys, and it's like... You know, like Sh Shinnok's the beginning and Kotal's the middle, and then there's like something going on at the end that we don't even know. Yeah, that's the big Maybe. shocking one that Ed Boon alluded to. I just want to put on a cross and say that'd be really interesting if we actually got an arcade mode like that, where we had a kind of a choose your own destiny a la UMK3 and 4 thing back and have different end bosses atop each other, the pillars. That'd be really nice. Just yeah. cross my well, The MK9 arcade had like it would randomly be either Goro or Kentaro. Maybe it'll mm -hmm. be something like that. Yeah. I'm a little bit more concerned about the skull and I think a lot of other people because I'm not, I mean, Cyborg is definitely right. Just because it is Shinnok's skull, it might, probably isn't, but if it is, you're right. That doesn't mean Shinnok's not in the game. What I'm thinking is, is Shinnok's popularity isn't quite up there. So I'm seeing like the Netherrealm guys at a board meeting saying, hey, we don't want to put Shinnok in the game. We want to put someone else in how do we get rid of this son of a bitch? And like, okay, well, how about Quan Chi kills him in the beginning, turns him into a skull, and it's done. It looks like a way out of putting Shinnok into the game. That's why I worry. I don't think Shinnok's guaranteed. I think there's a lot of... They've hinted at so many characters at this point, I don't even know what to believe. I thought Shinnok was a lock. I thought Fujin was a lock. Now I don't know anymore. Um, for DLC, I think Fujin, if he's not in the game already, I think he's guaranteed for DLC. Shinnok, I don't know i mean maybe that's what they're going for uh not get shinnok out of the way for popularity purposes now and then for dlc it's like well here's what could have happened and then have him in the game but i don't know i mean I i'm a little more nervous because i i miss shinnok i like shinnok i'm kind of yeah. sad that i couldn't play him competitively ever so yeah maybe this is just the anxiety coming out but i uh, i think say that uh all of Quan Chi's plans are successfully realized or something along, along those lines. That really makes me worry that, uh, that Shinnok might be gone for good. See, for feel, sure. I feel like why then why, if that was the case, if Shinnok's just going to get kind of passed over and it's just going to be quickly covered in the story mode, um, then why end MK9 with that cliffhanger of showing Shinnok and Quan Chi if they didn't plan on giving Shinnok another run, at least part of story mode, and then including him in the game in some form? of a of a notable form not just kind of passed over why why do that at the end of mk9 and granted there should be a full disclosure you know it's not like nrs or the mk team throughout all their history has always made sense out of every single decision they've done or yeah. constantly stuck to a certain story that they started but i just i don't understand why they would reveal Shinnok and his plans and you know talk to Quan Chi at the end essentially setting up mk4 events um if they're not going to at least give it a good run in story mode i don't expect the mk4 section if it if it indeed does get shown in story or played out i don't expect it to take up the majority by any means i think if anything it'll be you know the first five years which maybe you know half an hour of the story but i don't i don't know i, I mean, think it should be point. prominent that's true enough. i just i wonder if when they did make that cliffhanger at the end of mk9 
if there was a vision for MKX yet. I wonder if Ed Boon or Vogel I hope so. had in the back of their mind <laughs> that 25 years. I think it's definitely possible. Vogel especially. I think Vogel probably did have some idea of where he wanted to go. And Ed Boon, just, he always likes to reinvent the wheel. He, he never likes to do the same thing twice. He's really big on innovation, almost to a fault, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but um, in gameplay, not so much. In gameplay, I think he's really good about that. With the story mode, I think he's always about fresh, innovative, let's give someone a new experience. I don't know. I mean, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. I'm, I just, I'm just waiting for that one reveal. I'm waiting for that one trailer to show me that MK4 mattered, to show me that the events with the Nether Realm and Adenia are going to be something. Maybe not the same thing, but that 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 is a logical step in the great twenty-five year you know event. But I just don't know. I feel and like when I don't know. I lean towards skepticism. Yeah, just to be safe, well, and that's smart. I just feel like uh, I feel like you almost have to have the Nether Realm events uh, play out because that's what you know, excels Quan Chi to where he is. So without the interaction with Shinnok, it just kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like that falls apart. And I don't think that's something they should uh, just briefly cover. But uh, Razor sounded like he had something to say, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I actually think there is a pretty good chance that we will see Shinnok in the game. I mean, I don't know how much screen time the MK4 part will get. But it seems like, I mean, for one thing, Quan Chi not wearing the amulet anymore. So, guessing Shinnok has it. <laughs> it seems like if he was going to kill him, he'd probably hang on to the amulet, because it's, like, a really powerful item. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that. And there's also, I always felt like when Boone and, you know, when they'd have interviews where they'd sort of talk about MK4, they always sort of looked back with regret on the fact that Shinnok had potential and they sort of screwed up giving him like no moves of his own and they've sort of like especially with armageddon they tried to make him cool again like they made him sort of the main bad guy of armageddon like it's sort of subtle but he's definitely the guy who made it all happen even though like dagon and blaze get sort of the he's bigger behind the part scenes pulling strings for sure yeah yeah and like they, you know, completely revamped his moves and made him more about the, the skeleton hands that he had in his MK4 finishers. And I just think they they, they still want to, you know, fix Shinnok and make him a great villain that he, you know, the villain that he could be because he's, I think, you know, he's more interesting and potentially more powerful than Shao Kahn, and I'd like to see him, you know, live up to that. They've already sold me. I, I already love Shinnok. Um, he was, to me, the best part of MK Armageddon. I loved his personality around the other around Taven versus when Taven was gone, and you see like this complete 180, and he's, you know, I loved that. And they don't really need to sell me anymore, but hopefully they'll sell everyone else. Hopefully they'll make the most badass rendition of Shinnok of all time. But I've never been a big Quan Chi fan because I was always a Shinnok fan. I thought trying to maintain power and try to hold on to your throne, that was more interest interesting to me than just. Quan Chi's deceptive. I'm I'm smarter than everyone around me. I'm always one step ahead. Even Shang Tsung, you know, Shang Tsung had the same idea as Quan Chi, but he wasn't clever enough to pull it off. So that dude actually had a day job, and that was interesting to me. You know, it's like, I want power, I can't get it. While Quan Chi being one step ahead all the time just isn't terribly interesting to me. So I'm hoping for Shinnok. I'm definitely cheering him on. I would like to believe that Shinnok's going to be a major force that comes into play during the storyline. I don't know. I look at Cassie Cage, who is apparently, you know, I mean, she, she she's a cop, right? And or or she she's, or she's part of the special she's, forces. She's in the army. She has like a U.S. Army, army logo on her it shoulder. Kind of, it kind of implies to me that you know she's had time to grow up and learn and train, and that tells me that at the very least, you know, if either events in MK4 played out the way that they originally did, and that Shinnok took a fall really early, so that you know Earthrealm is still free and Cassie's still got time to you know grow up, or they didn't play out at all. Because Quan Chi killed him. And I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. In any case, well, you're just hoping for good things like for Shinnok. The, the way that like it seems like it's going to be is sort of similar to the way the games usually are, where you know something would happen, but it would be brief. You know, it, it, it wasn't like if Shinnok invades, it's not going to last for 10 years. It's just going to be like, this is what happened 
at the five-year point, and then there was a big period of nothing, and this is what happened at the ten-year point, and then there was a big bunch of nothing, and, you know, there was peace in between. Yeah. Yeah, it's... I don't know, that's... it's Like you said earlier, it's going to be tough to see how they cover 25 years and two hours or whatever the story mode length is going to be. That's, that's probably the biggest um, sense of intrigue I have currently, because... I don't think anybody was expecting a 25-year leap and playing out that 25-year leap following MK9. I think everybody expected MK4 and then what would be the next yeah. game. So I feel like yeah. I feel like if they had done this after Armageddon, like that would be amazing. Like that sort of the thing I wanted to see at the end of the old timeline was how these characters grow old and like pass on to the next generation or have their happy or unhappy endings as the case may be that was you know the resolution that we were sort of promised armageddon would give and it didn't like yeah. i didn't you know nobody wanted those stories to end with all those guys dead in a desert <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like to see Maybe it happen to the reboot is a shame because <laughs> like i'm you know most of the characters that i wanted to see grow and carry on are the ones who are dead yeah. Well, we'll just have to see how it plays out, and hopefully we'll get some sort of sense or some sort of trailer in the next few months that at least gives us some sort of sense of direction and an idea of what plays out other than just the little kind of breadcrumbs we've been given and that people have just speculated on and pieced together themselves. But hopefully we'll at least see something that gives us an idea of what to expect. I don't I don't want to know everything, but it would sure be nice to have a direction or some, something, you know, a nice foundation to base some thoughts off. Right now we're just kind of throwing some shots in the dark based on the very little information we've gotten. Story mode's been pretty well kept under wraps thus far, but we are pretty far out from the game, so... Um, all right, well, moving on to Quan Chi's gameplay, because <laughs> we just talked about his appearance. And... <laughs> well, let's just get it out of the way right now. The horse is awesome. The horse is freaking awesome. Yeah, that, I, that, I like horse, the horse. that horse is amazing. I, everybody needs a horse. There's there's almost something silly to me about Quan Chi riding a horse, especially because he can make portals and he's got a whole gameplay variation based around it. But <laughs> it, it kind of cool feels like, look. yeah. It he doesn't sort of makes need me to, wonder. But he does. He's a showman. There's almost a, like a four horsemen of the apocalypse aesthetic to it, which makes me like want the MK4 story to be told all the more because that's basically what it was. You know, hell rising up and attacking the realms of the living, and yeah. like biblical revelations and that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. That would that would be really interesting if that's the way it goes. And I agree. Um, I also agree that Quan Chi is a showman because, I mean, just look at the guy. Look at the way he dresses. Look at the way he acts. Look at the way he talks. That, that's not a guy that, you know, errs on the side of subtlety. He's a guy that's over the top. He's the kind of guy that demands your attention. He just, he I just... feel that he was in theater before he found his call. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's where his love of skulls came. He, he was a big fan of Hamlet. Oh, definitely Shakespearean. <laughs> yeah. He just He just reeks of it, you know? Yeah, that's Last canon now. We're going to stick so with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, his, his gameplay looks really fun. Um, I really enjoy his use of portals, which is also another kind of kind of talking about noobs uh, elements kind of being played on. Uh, it seems like that's another element of noob that could potentially not the same exact way he used it, obviously, but it's another element that they're giving Quan Chi. Um, I like... I feel like his necromancer, he should be playing with more than just that bat that's, like, from yeah, hell. Yeah, the, the, the summoner variation. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, I feel like he should have some more creepy, crawly, you know, disturbing things, or even bring up the dead people, the dead Earthrealm warriors in some way. And I mean, that remains to be seen if that is a factor. They could just be holding back not to spoil anything. But uh, I feel like, yeah, he should be using more elements re resulting or... Relating to death rather than just like a, a hell bat. So Yeah, like people people have always said that they wanted to see him do more moves where he like summons skeletons or like that skull wall from the deception cinematic. Yeah, this the and... skeleton the skeleton thing though is kind of uh a uh, hazy sub or not hazy, but you're walking a fine line because isn't that Shinnok's big uh 
that's the kind of thing that I think I'd much prefer well, to see Shinnok do. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I would like Shinnok to see that. Shinnok has, like, had, like, the giant hands. Yeah. And here's another, like, Shinnok's moves in um, Armageddon, he had, like, the, the giant fist, and he had, like, the, the one that would come out of the ground and grab you. But yeah. then he also had a portal, and now Quan Chi is doing portals, True. so... Yeah, that's... that's... Yeah, I, I didn't think about that. I seem to recall Quan Chi having a bunch of uh, interesting little special moves when you fought him way back in mythologies as a boss. Oh, yeah, he had, he had like, a... There was just a regular fireball, and there was sort of, like, a stun like Sindel scream, and he had sort of, like, a magnetic pull you in. I mean, I his moves in mythologies really didn't have anything to do with the moves he's had in every other game. He's kind of a master of multiple techniques, this guy. I don't think there's any shortage of what they could come up with for him to do. He he changes his moves more than I think anybody else. The only like the only ones that seem to stay the same are the the skull throw, and even that like has been toned down, like because it used to like chew on you, and now it's just a fireball. Yeah. Or um the the teleport, and that's changed too, because it used to be he'd like like stop on you like river dance with both feet. <laughs> and I always preferred it that way, whereas, like, in MK9, he's sort of just stomping and kicking with one foot. Like, he's just... It's just kind of like an angry curb stomp. Yeah, it's too restrained. I mean, it's right, it's too it, conservative. It's you know? too... He's going more for, like, slow, powerful kicks instead of, like, fast, furious kicks. And I I feel like that's where it changes. And I don't know. So yeah, something about the MK4 version was just phenomenally fun to do just when you did it on your opponent and not only pissed them off so you could really piss your friend off doing it which is funny but also it's just it's just had that impact rather than just this you know a couple powerful kicks but i feel like real quick on the stop that's a great potential for a friendship if those ever return as he should just teleport stomp but don't land on the opponent and just start tap dancing <laughs> 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 I feel like they wanted an MK4 to showcase the fact that he's got a lot of rage, probably. And it's like the really multiple tapping on your head and, yeah. and, and your chest. And especially where he'd rip off your leg. And like un, unlike any other fatality, he'd just still be beating you with it after as soon as they'd cut to uh, the challenge ladder or your next fight. Yeah. He's an angry, angry guy. I think, I mean, uh, regardless of your thoughts on Quan Chi as whether you like the character or not, I think Quan Chi has... His whole look, appearance, and voice, the deep voice, and um, his his moveset and abilities uh, give him the most potential for, like, the creepiest character. Like, a character that can really just creep you out. Like, I feel like he is one of those characters that has that potential if they play him right. Like, I, uh, I felt when I saw him in the trailer that he looked a little bit, like, lanky and thin. And I think that's what he should be. He should be this thin lanky he shouldn't be this muscle bound dude he should just be this guy that can literally you know use his sorcery and necromancy and all that to just really creep the hell out of you and just completely mess you up which you know that's kind of what his fatality does and i i love that factor about him i yeah, think sincerity yeah. to him for sure cool. if, yeah. if nothing else he's always been like the epitome of like goth or like he's almost he's like a horror movie villain yeah he's he's just like like Hellraiser, like uh, like I mean, that's obviously. I feel like at this point, if if any, it's an inspiration for his outfit because he definitely looks like something out of Hellraiser, like a Cenobite. I don't know if you guys ever watched those movies, but oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm big into horror movies like that, so yeah, like that. He just totally has that vibe, and I love that about him because, like you said, if there's any character that fits that, like you said, it's that he has that gothic kind of just creepy. Like he's the kind of dude that would just make you chew your own face off and just laugh at you while you do it, and it's just that's creep. That's the kind of things that creeps you out. And he's kind of a diplomat in that way, you know. Uh, looking back on Pinhead, Pinhead, he was one to negotiate. He talks about things before he goes crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, and and Quan Chi, he's been the middleman for so long, and I think that explains the rage. He's been in the servitude business for probably God thousands of years. That's probably. I mean. If he was there from the beginning with Shinnok, God, I it's not I can't even calculate that. And with so yeah, definitely. What's and up? with and with Quan Chi, it he doesn't ever in his tone, in his voice, and in his mannerisms, he never. And I could be wrong. I'm not the I'm not the biggest expert on the story and everything, but everything with him does not come across as personal. He's the kind of bone chilling guy that just does business because business needs to be done a certain way to 
get you know get where he wants things to go but he never like it doesn't ever seem like he does things out of personal hatred towards somebody or personal animosity he's the type of person that will just cut you down and stab you in the back because it needs to be done not because he he could he could have his best friend and just cut him down if it needed to be done type of thing that's the kind of guy that i feel like quan chi is he never breaks character he never loses his cool like ever and if you're trying to deceive the person you work for and you've worked for him for thousands, maybe millions of years. You, you, I mean, that that's you have to do that, yeah. and that translates so well into his character. Never loses his cool, never raises his voice, but he's always always right, and he hates everything. And I think that works really well. That he's comes together in a nice way. Yeah, yes, I mean, he is. I'll, I'll, I'll not hold you guys like remember the old conquest series, but like I, I seem to have this mental image of him just being on a being on a throne or sitting down and casually conducting business while staring at you with these impenetrable eyes this is a guy who just sits back thinks about the best way to win over you and kill you as he's doing it and he's been doing this with shinnok for the better part of several thousand years i think harvesting and harnessing that rage it's yeah. wonderful yeah i think quan chi is sort of at the same time the least developed character of all the villains and the one who being undeveloped works for the best because it's sort of like you know, his origin is that he was a demon, he was an Oni in the Nether Realm, and then he like learned magic and evolved into like a more human looking and more intelligent character. Yeah. And it's just like from that he's like personality wise, he's just a clinical sociopath. Like he just doesn't have empathy for other people and he's all about just, you know, his plans and moving up the ladder and getting power for himself and using people and you know, that that works for him, whereas, like, a guy like, you know, Shang Tsung's motivation is he just, you know, he's afraid of aging and dying, so he just, he'll do whatever it takes to stay alive and to, you know, feed on those souls to keep him young, and he's just sort of craven and cowardly, and you've got Shao Kahn, who's also sort of poorly developed. As far as we can tell, he's just kind of mentally ill or something, you know, just angry and not sure what he wants except to conquer realms because they've been sort of wishy-washy or confusing about that whole trying to put together a family thing with uh, Sindel and Katana and Melina yeah. and they've sort of retconned it in MK9 where like, you know, I didn't love you, I just let you around because Sindel convinced me to and I really like Melina best and... <laughs> but... There's a megalomania about Shou Kahn and everything has to fit into that Everything has to fit into the context of his ego. And that, that's what I always assumed was Shao Kahn's motivation was just this grand ego. Yeah, Shao Kahn's very ego-centric. Uh, Shang Tsung just wants to keep, you know, like you said, staying young. Out of out of the big bosses, Shang Tsung seems the most uh, like he could get emotionally attached to somebody. And I don't mean like in a romantic way or any ridiculous fashion like that. I mean like... He, he's the type of guy that seems like if he had a really good henchman, he's going to want to keep that henchman around. He he probably likes that henchman. But, you know, you Reptile. know, yeah, any any I was just thinking that exact. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Any yeah. villain at the end of the day would obviously turn on that henchman if they, you know, it's comes to their survival. But that's why they're a henchman. And that's why he's the boss. But I'm saying out of, out of all of them, it seems like Quan Chi is the one that cares the least. Like we've all just pretty much gave examples for and. He cares the least. He doesn't care about egos. He doesn't care about anything. He just wants to just get done what he needs to get done. And that that kind of cold, like uncaring, like you said, horror villain aspect to him, like a Jason. Yeah, yeah. He just does. Eyes, everyone is a tool to be used. Absolutely, yeah. everyone. It's like Shang is the most human and relatable yeah. villain, and Quan Chi is the most inhuman and alien villain. Yeah, exactly. And Shinnok that's why this game needs to have him back because it'd be interesting to see him get more because even though Quan Chi isn't as developed as we'd like he's also been around for so long in so many games now that we have a great idea of how he conducts himself in so many different situations where Shinnok hasn't had that opportunity so it'd definitely be cool to see that played up more you really need both because Shinnok's relationship to Quan Chi if you take Quan Chi out of the picture does Shinnok have any established relationships with any, with any other character? It would be it's really, really hard to develop. About it. <laughs> That's true, So, but they would have to be in the room together so much for... I think Quan Chi brings out all of Shinnok's personality because that's where all the rapport is. And yeah. yeah, you definitely need that relationship. Well, I think there's also 
there, there's a possibility that you could have like a dynamic between uh, Shinnok and Dagon if Dagon were in the game, and you know, there's been like hints with the comic covers that the Red Dragons might be a plot element. Yeah. But yeah, Quan Chi and Shinnok definitely works best. Like I was just thinking to myself, like if you put a a, a blade to like it, basically each one of them are on their last breath of life, they know they're defeated. You have Shang Tsung, and you have a blade next to his neck or whatever. Shang Tsung's the type of dude that would beg for his life, you know, just beg you to stay alive. He's just, you know, he's cowardly like that when it comes down to it. He just wants to live. Shao Kahn's the type of guy that would insult you to the very end, just kind of laugh at you and just be like, he thinks he's better than you and doesn't realize that he's beaten. Quan Chi's the type of guy that would basically just keep his mouth shut and just take it like a man because he just does not care. He's just cold. I don't know, that's just the way I view the three of them. <laughs> but anyways, continue. <laughs> I feel I feel like Quan Chi might in that situation like give a speech that convinces you to put the knife to your own throat. Yeah, true. And that that was my he other thought. Distract you with talk while summoning up a skull from behind to gnaw on your head. Yeah, that that was my other thought. Either he's just going to remain silent and take it or he's the type of person that's will somehow cuz he's just such a good manipulator in that business sense that he's the type of person that would convince you that you need him to be alive but not in a like a a begging sort of way he's just the type of cool calm collected dude that would talk you out of it and then talk you into being his best friend and then stab you, you in the back when <laughs> you could kill me now or yeah or we could do this together and then you could kill me <laughs> even though he'll turn on you before you get the chance so it's just yeah three minutes later you're being beaten to death <laughs> on leg yeah exactly <laughs> to give Quan Chi a chance to talk and discuss the issue you've already lost pretty much there's really <laughs> yeah. just, just a knife in the throat just live, finish Scorpion? it let me show you this cartoon <laughs> yeah they should put they should uh, that'd be great they should put Quan Chi in a Bond movie and then in the typical anytime a Bond movie villain is sitting there like has him beaten has him in like a trap and he sits there and tries to talk to him and brag about it and give him a chance they should just literally skip to a screen that says three minutes later and like Shadowloo said he's just being beaten by his own leg you don't know how he did it but you just know <laughs> that it's completely within the realm of possibility and likelihood that that's how it'd play out <laughs> so now i'm imagining uh quan chi turning around in a very uh uh blowfeld bond villain chair petting a <laughs> demon cat with half of its face missing <laughs> well he has the chair we've seen the chair it was in his uh windows from k9 it's it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. a nice chair can can't rob him of that, but um, I was thinking the Conan, James Earl Jones, the you and I aren't so different kind of route out of the situation. You know? <laughs> but it would work with Quan Chi. James Earl Jones got his head. But... Yeah. yeah. You know, Quan Chi knows your deep psychological problems and how to use them against you. Yeah, he's definitely the best manipulator out of the bunch. And yeah, I just, I, I agree with everybody. I, I, I hope Shinnok gets a good portion because I, I would like to label him up there and see more personality from him than what we got from MK4 and Armageddon. But uh, any other thoughts on Quan Chi's gameplay? We didn't. We kind of went off on a tangent there, but it, that was a good discussion. But uh, I think we covered most of just the aspects of Quan Chi's gameplay that were worth noting. Any well, other I'm thoughts? Looking forward, I'm looking They're... forward to the Warlock variation and the, uh, the counter zoning aspect of him. That looks to be the most fun to me so far. Yeah, yeah, that looks real good. Um, I think there are concerns about the the sorcerer variation, the the leaving like areas on the ground that you have to stand in to buff yourself. Yeah. I think. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh gonna be interesting to see how that plays out because that's that can be really abused if in the right hands, and that'll be I don't I don't even know how. How would they? I don't, I'm just confused at how they would go about making that work yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, it seems like the problem is to use it to its full potential. You have to like really reduce both your and the opponent's mobility. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, maybe. Well, let's put it this way: maybe it's matchup specific, and if you have a character you're fighting that puts you in the corner and does it easily, uh, there were characters in MK9 that could bully you into the corner. Cage was one of them. Maybe it's not meant to be used for damage. Maybe you set that that field so it's like, okay, you want to fight in the corner? Well, nah, I have the upper hand in damage. And you're just trying to control space, and you're trying to put Quan Chi in the most ideal spot. But some matchups, some characters are not going to give a shit about that at all. So 
it's going to be situational for sure. Maybe it'll be better than I think if the risk reward is there. If the bonus is good enough, then there could be some comeback factor in that. But we'll see. If I do play Quan Chi, I probably won't. But if I do, that's probably going to be my variation. So far, at least. I, I, I like status bonuses. I, I like increases in damage. I feel like if I can have a passive ability, I can play my game no matter what. And I think that's cool. All right, well, uh, moving on to Quan Chi's Fatality. Um, any thoughts? I, I really like how it starts off with uh, him forcing the opponent to walk into his own blade floating in the air. Um, I did not care for the way it ended, and I thought of a cooler way to end it, but I, what are your guys' thoughts on it? I really, really enjoy the fact that he controls them into walking mouth first into their own blade. I mean, into his blade. It's wonderful. It's gruesome. It's the kind of thing that he would do to you as, you know, you know, watching you die, watching the life slip out of your eyes and making you do it yourself. It's cruel. It's unnecessary cruel. And, and it totally works for him. Oh, yeah. It, that alone is my favorite, my single favorite part of any revealed fatality so far. But Again, excuses to kind of show that, you know, people can be torn in half and shredded. And it would just be so much more effective if rather than being, you know, cut in half after that, like from the mouth down, they just fell down face first onto the blade. I'd like that a lot more. That aside, amazing fatality. Yeah, I. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that like the the walking mouth first, like being mind controlled into the sword is awesome. And that the ending is sort of like once once he gets you with the sword all the way into your head he just he just telekinetically lifts you and the sword cuts you in half and then you flop down in two pieces sort of like the MK2 Kung Lao hat one but um i feel like it could have ended like in a lot better ways like he could have then made them grab the sword and cut their own head open or he could have ceased the mind control and they'd be all like oh god what's happened there's a sword in my mouth and just panic <laughs> die like that <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking i i feel like it should have started off with him controlling them walking into the sword and then either he makes them finish the job but in a way that isn't you know cutting them in half they should have just twisted it and then pulled it out and handed it back to him i thought that would have been great like they literally just walk into it, take it out all nonchalant, have him or have the character walk over calmly, hand him the sword as if like here, thank you, and then puts it back into wherever the hell he keeps it, and then releases control, and they just panic and die. Uh, or, in the sense that he has them uh, walk into it, and then they control the sword and just like finish it by cutting through their body, but not in that, not in the fashion that we've seen you know, tons of times with the cut in half like that. I just think that was that was one of probably the worst ways they could have gone about ending it in that fashion because, like you said, it's been done before and I don't understand the whole telekinetically lifting them up through the sword like yeah, that. Yeah, it feels like it's um like too much into Ermac and Kenshi territory yeah. at that point. Yeah, it just it just lacks I feel like they had a really creative idea and then just completely lost all that creativity towards the end which is a shame but i mean it's still a fantastic fatality but i don't understand it's like a it's like a movie having a really it's a really great movie but having a really poor ending it can just kind of leave a sour taste in your mouth and it kind of takes away a, a bunch from the movie it's it's the mass effect three of fatalities <laughs> <laughs> maybe if we complain enough they'll change it for us <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then uh kotaku can call us entitled yeah um uh so yeah i think we're all in pretty much agreement that yeah it was, it was a really cool concept and it's great up until he makes like lifts them up through the sword and takes that way about it hell if they would have just lifted the sword up through their head like you said just like lift it upwards instead of splitting down then it just leaves a you know a big gaping gash with their head split open and that would have been far cooler at least because you're only splitting part of their body not completely cutting them in half like always so that was just kind of weird and yeah yeah i've sort of yeah. i like when they yeah. sort of do the head kind of hanging wide open at the top like um there was a kung lao one and challenge monks that did it and like johnny cage is with the award and mk9 did it yeah 
I just I kind of wish that he just fall face first onto the blade, you know, just jam it in there halfway, then release release the mind control, have them like you know fall to their knees and just face hits the ground, blade comes up through the back of their neck. Yeah, that'd be pretty gruesome, I find. Or I mean, if, if he for some reason all of a sudden has the ability to telekinetically control his opponents, he should have just uh, had them uh, lie on the ground with their or make them walk into the sword part way and then create a portal so they fall through the portal and he releases control so they fall face first into the sword. Just, Ooh, you know, nice. They're completely lost control at that point, so their momentum just takes them through the rest of the way. But, you know, just things like that. But, you know, obviously they don't spend, you know, the five minutes that we just took to come up with all those ideas. So <laughs> they, get, they, wrote, they got a schedule. <laughs> they got the, five minutes is too much for that. But anyways... Um, any other thoughts on his fatality? Who, who are we to argue with Ed Stick figures? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do we know? We should probably just make our own game because we don't like it. Um, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> is 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 that all it for the Quan Chi discussion? I think I've said my piece. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that wraps it up for the returning characters. So we just have one more quick segment to do here um, that I hope to make a. A reoccurring thing, because it would be nice to cover all the characters in the uh, MK uh, roster at some point or another. But basically, we're just going to take a character that we just decide that we want to talk about and kind of cover them throughout the series, our favorite incarnations of them, etc., and their fatalities, yada, yada, yada. And this week, we decided to start off with Johnny Cage. So, Razor, why don't you start us off on just your overall thoughts on Johnny Cage, your favorite uh Johnny Cage from all the games and your favorite fatality of Johnny Cage. All right. Well, I feel like I should cover a little bit of history first, uh, just because, like, I'm the story guy and that sort of people expect to hear some insights on that. So, I mean, so people, uh, most people know that when Mortal Kombat was originally developed, it was going to be uh, a tie in game with uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. And that fell through, and they decided to make their own. So I guess Johnny was the first or one of the first characters they came up with, and he was basically like a spoof of Van Damme, uh, particularly Van Damme's character in Bloodsport. And uh, for those who don't know, the movie Bloodsport is sort of based on a true story. Like, the Van Damme's character, Frank Dukes, is a real guy. And, like, the thing, like, Johnny is a parody of even his story because, like... Dukes was, like, this guy who was sort of controversial in the martial arts world because he claimed that, like, his fighting style was real authentic ninjutsu from, like, the feudal era. And he was telling these stories about how this deathmatch tournament he fought in, the Kumite, was a real thing. And nobody believed him. Everybody took him for a fraud. So, like, so here you've got Johnny, whose story starts out, you know, he's an actor. People think he's a fraud. So he's going to a deathmatch tournament to prove that he can really fight. And um, Johnny Johnny is one of my favorite characters. Uh, he's he's my main to play as an MK9. And um, the problem, though, I find with Johnny is sort of there's a lot of games that you know they they've put him on the roster, but he doesn't really do anything, and it's hard to sort of justify his presence there story wise. Like he's just another Earth fighter, and that's really all there is to him. Where he came to get an idea for a movie or, you know, something like that, and that sort of... So there have been periods as a fan where I was all like, I wish they'd just retire Johnny or, you know, that the, the, the they had left him on the shelf for this one or that one, but I think that um, the thing that sort of intrigues me about Cage is sort of the potential for, like, what happens if he gets serious, because... They they teased it in trilogy with the uh, he died but he's you know he's back from the dead only until the merger ends so like he's just back long enough to fight the war and then he'll die again so it's like it would have been interesting to see if MK9 had been just a straight retelling instead of like history had changed how he would interact with the other characters and like especially with his relationship with with Sonya, like that whole living on borrowed time thing and like the sort of the tearful saying goodbye at the end or like um, in Armageddon, they did the story where like 
Raiden was evil and Liu Kang was dead. So Johnny was all like, I guess I'll be the leader now. And, it, you know, that would have been sort of interesting to see if that game had had cutscenes, you know, that covered that. And, um, but in MK9, they've sort of really uh, improved him. Like, he's like the one guy who came out of the end of the game looking better than he ever has before. I mean, you could make an argument for Striker too, but he died, so it kind of breaks even. Yeah, who cares? But, like, Johnny really, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'd give it to Nightwolf, really... too. I don't know. I feel like Nightwolf was important in MK3, and people just didn't realize it. And they're just sort of seeing it for the first time, because it's actually being in the cutscenes. You uh -huh. know what I mean? But, like, as He's... far as Johnny and MK9 goes, like, they, you know, they took him, and, like, him and Sonya are the only, like, survivors, and you know, his arcade ending was all like, there's all this secret power in Johnny that he needs to learn how to control, and maybe he could be the big hero in the future. And especially tying him more to Sonya and the fact that he has a kid in Cassie in this game, it's sort of, you know, he's more plot relevant than he's ever been before. And, you know, I'm excited to sort of see where that goes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but, um, like, as far as, like, his move set and like why he's my main like i just he's sort of really easy to use and you know like he's got that uh temp knows how to do it the button's probably off the top of his head that that little kick string where he just stands on one foot and goes like kick, kick, yeah kick, the kick. forward three three back three kind of yeah yeah that's like one of the longest but easiest strings in the game and then you like I just found him, like, because I'm not a great player, you know, I'm not a guy who's ever going to go to the tournaments, and I don't play online much because I don't like dealing with lag or talking to strangers all that often, but, like, so I'm I'm very casual as a player, and I just, I really gravitate to Johnny because he's very, you know, his combos are easy, but they're long, they're very quick, you know, he's, like, he's just real good for a beginner, and he's a really strong, like, upper-tier character. And I and I hope that, you know, if, if he is, he's probably an MKX. I think Ed accidentally leaked that he will be. But I just, I hope to see, like, more of that, you know, the just a really strong character who's easy to use. And, you know, I love that his moves really fit his personality, and especially now that he, like, talks more during the fight. All right, well, what was so, your... Uh... Is, so are you saying MK9 was your favorite incarnation of Johnny Cage thus far? Uh, I suppose it is. I mean, before MK9, I would have said my favorite was uh, Shaolin Monks, because that's the game that invented the catchphrase, you just got caged. Uh-huh. Yeah, but um, yeah, so right now 9 is definitely my favorite, though. Like, like I said, most of the characters got really sort of screwed over, at least in terms of story. And he came out looking like a winner by the end. And what would you say your uh, favorite fatality is that Johnny Cage has ever had? Um, I suppose my favorite fatality would be his Mortal Kombat 4 torso rip, where um, he, he twists him at the waist and makes that sickening crunch before he rips him off. Yeah, that's beautiful. Just, there was something really uh, more powerful and guttural about that one than, like, the others he's had. All right. Well, uh, I, I agree completely on the uh, fatality aspect. I My favorite one was from Mortal Kombat 4 as well. I just feel like that one, the the sound effects used can, uh, uh, the sound effects used can usually like make a really, like or just like it can change a good fatality to a great fatality in the sense that it really can feel impactful or if it feels like if something feels off, then you lo it loses impact. And with that fatality, I felt like everything was right where it needed to be. I felt the bone crunching and everything just sounded perfect. And then obviously ripping it off, just it just felt very brutal and vicious, which I thought was perfect. It just was just completely well done, better than anything else. I'd say probably like a, a runner up would be the the award going into the opponent's head from MK9. Uh, and the award yeah. goes to, I believe it was called. Um, and yeah, yeah, that would be my second favorite too. Yeah, and overall thoughts on Johnny Cage, I would agree 
that the MK9 version of Johnny Cage definitely did him a lot of good. It's my favorite by far. I I like Johnny Cage as a character, but he was never one of my favorites by any means. But um, in MK9, I really liked the way he played. I liked the way his personality came across in story mode. I thought he got a lot more of a chance to shine. And he definitely made himself look like somebody that could potentially be one of the faces of the franchise going forward. And I think that's really really interesting and I'm really intrigued to see where he goes in the future. I thought his outfit in MK9 was perfect with his name across his chest. It wasn't even his last name, like his family name. It was literally his first name, so you can't get any more full of yourself than that, but that's why it's perfect for him. Um, and I just, yeah, the overall look, I love him putting on his shades at the end of the match and then they breaking in half and then putting on another pair of shades. Perfect Johnny Cage. He just He's overflowing with personality and cockiness, and it just, it really shows. Yeah, um, I think MK9 kind of sold me on Johnny Cage. Um, I've always liked him. I've always thought he was a cornerstone of the series because that campiness, that that sense of humor is so MK to me. And But when MK9 came out, he played so much like his personality would kind of unfold, and I don't see that with as many characters as I think I should. Um, I, I love Johnny Cage. I really hope we see him more in the future, no matter what. Prequel, sequel. I feel like he needs to be there. And, I mean, I, I think he's he's unique overall. You don't see a lot of characters who are good, but have the qualities that he has. I mean, it, Johnny Cage shows that you can have a kind of a false perception of reality and sort of an incredibly high self-esteem and unhealthily high self-esteem, but still kind of have, have a grounded sense of right and wrong. And I think because of that, you're going to put him with other characters and it's always going to be interesting. Um, he's the one character who I could see Havoc being annoyed by. I, I would see Hotaro and him in the same room and just, it would be hilarious. It'd be like the best thing ever. And you don't get that with a lot of characters. If you put Raiden and maybe Nightwolf in the same room, it'd be interesting, but you're not going to have those same dynamics. No one contributes what Johnny Cage contributes, in my opinion. And... Just in terms of the tournament scene, I I love what they did with him. I love his gameplay. And no one knew. For a long time, no one had any idea how good Cage was until I think a tournament player from the UK, Foxy Grandpa, was actually doing things with him. And no one thought Johnny Cage was very, very viable. And then that guy said, you guys don't even know what's coming. You have no idea what you're getting into. And, of course, by the middle of 2013, no, 2012, you're seeing Johnny Cage in all these top eights now. He's winning tournaments. The cabal players are counterpicking with Johnny Cage, and I just love that. It says so much about the community. It says so much about the character design. Because uh, it, it's not obvious. When you play with Johnny Cage, it's not obvious that he's good because you're trying to do these 40% combos, which we, which he has, obviously, now. We, they weren't so clear because we didn't know about the dash punch, dash punch, and the juggles. But just a very interesting character. I love his MK9 costume or rendition you know, there's so much personality going on, yet it's so simple, and I wish more costumes were like that. Uh, as for fatalities, um, I, I really like the, the the head uppercut decapitation with the three heads. I, I think that glitch is so representative of just Mortal Kombat history in general. It, MK has had its share of glitches, and I mean, I, I'm guessing it was a glitch. I don't think it was intentional. If it was, even better. Hell yeah, but... I think it was yeah. like it was a glitch in MK1, and then they brought it back on purpose in MK2. Yeah, and thank God they did. They're just it, <laughs> everything fits with that character. Everything comes together so beautifully, and I, so many other characters don't. So many other characters, the way they play, I'm just like, why would they do that? Like I, I've mentioned Cabal in the past, who just jumps backwards and shoots fireballs for about half a match. That that's not Cabal to me. But then again, have you ever seen his Nomad cancels? That is Cabal. That is exactly how he would fight. And a lot of people were saying that needs to go. That needs to be nerfed. He's too powerful. And I don't know if I agree with that. Cabal was definitely S plus tier. But I don't think that was the problem. I think it, if you know the matchup, you can poke out of that. You can deal with that. It was Honestly, it was that in conjunction with everything else. But yeah, I want to see so much more Johnny Cage. I want to see that gameplay evolve. I want them to make it a little harder. Don't make it so easy to do. Maybe make forward three a special move, like a quarter circle forward. I think they made it a little too easy. It was a little too easy to utilize in footsies, but I can't say enough good things about Johnny Cage. And a lot of people don't see it. And that it's understandable because I didn't see it for a long time. 
but I think people are finally starting to come around. Some aren't. I think their time will come. They'll they'll find something they like about the character. All right, so I guess I'm a pretty lifelong Johnny Cage fan. I've always been a fan of his. I've I'm never sorry to not. I mean, I'm never sorry to see him come back. I think I feel like there's always a place for him, whether it's just being a generic good guy. In recent games, with the more cinematic feel and perspective, he he adds so much to the presentation aspect of the game. I couldn't picture an MK without him from this point on. It'd, it'd be really seriously missing something. I feel like he gets kind of an unfair reputation as a joke character a lot of the time. You know, people I've seen people like kind of lump him in with Bo Raichou and MoCap and Meat and I don't know. There's a there's a lot more going on under those shades than just narcissism and and, and 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 bad puns and jokes. I've also been really kind of touched by the fact that in MK4, after he'd initially you know died and gone on to his rest, and that they actually asked Raiden to you know craft a like craft a new body form or bring him back to life, and you know here's a guy with paradise. He's happy. He's dead, but he's happy, and he wants to go back down there and fight the good fight and help out his friends. And well, it's touching. It's really nice. Now, design-wise, I've always loved when he's fought with shades on. I feel I feel like you do need that cocky aspect of him to really come through in fighting, like Temp said. Like his personality so so thoroughly comes through, comes forth in MK9 through his um, mannerisms, his speech, and uh, MK9 absolutely has my favorite incarnation of Johnny right here. I've always loved the MK2 like kind of karate pants he's got going on and. The, the cage belt and the Johnny tattoo, they completely nailed Cage and MK9. He's, he's without question my favorite version of the character that's ever, ever existed. If I had to file a grievance about Cage at all in recent times, it's that MK9 gave this background detail to him that he was, quote, a descendant of an ancient Mediterranean cult who bred warriors for the gods. And for a character who's shtick started out as being you know i'm real i'm legitimate this is who i am to have to turn around and, and have a realization that he doesn't really know half about as much of himself as he thought he did I don't know, kind of undercuts it a little bit ultimately important kind of a side detail but i just don't think it was really all that necessary favorite well, fatality for cage i've always been a fan of the mk for uh, torso rip, it's a lot of fun. MK2 as well. Uh, twisting MK4 was a wonderful touch. To add to it. I'm actually kind of really surprised that I don't think he's had much involving shadows in his fatalities. There was in MK1 um, the censored SNES version. Rather than have him uppercut someone's head off, what what he did is instead was he just sort of you know put his foot up through your chest at close distance. I guess you're supposed to assume that he was crushing your heart in there with his foot. And I've always loved to. I've always would have loved to see them do something like that in recent years. So that's about where I stand on Cage. Big fan, gameplay wise, hell yes. One of my favorite things to ever do in MK2 was just get up with the ball buster, then give the drop kick, juggle them up with a uh, uppercut or a shadow kick. He's always been a blast to play, no matter what. He's definitely fun. You don't have a bad time when you're playing as Cage. I'm not the most technical fighter out there. I wouldn't call myself casual, but I don't know. If I'm playing as Cage, I actually I don't, I don't know if I care about winning or losing. I just have a lot of fun with him. That's that's the trick of it. I do wonder what would be best for him in the future, though. I think about you know that rising shadow uppercut he had back in MK2 and the shadow flip kick that that Deadly Alliance gave him. I don't know which one I enjoy more. I think I think I enjoy the flip kick a little bit more. If if, if, if I had to choose between the two of them, because I don't know, the uppercut always kind of struck me as too Ryu or Kenish. I think the flip kick gives him a bit more identity. If I don't know. Or maybe it's too guilish. I have no idea. <laughs> ah, I'll take either one. I, I kind of like that the EX version does both. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, any other thoughts on Cage before we wrap this up? Um, I do want to say I, I agree that I wish his fatalities like used the shadow uh, special effect more. Like... He had his other MK4 fatality, which was just the head punch, but it added in this bit where he'd, like, duck low and, like, charge up his fist green before he did the punch. And uh -huh. it's always sort of disappointed me that he doesn't do that, like, in any of the other, like, the games that came later that had the punch. I don't know, I just... I kind of wish there was sort of more, um... I feel like sometimes with Johnny, 
And this is sort of a problem that affects the adaptations more often than the actual games. But I feel like Johnny is sort of an example of... They always sort of take the magical element out of Mortal Kombat when it comes to the humans, because they sort of want to put a contrast between like the, the real world of Earth and the supernatural characters from Outworld. And I, it, that sort of bothers me because I feel like it's an important element of the MK universe that guys like Lou and Johnny have, you know, this martial arts chi energy or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, they they actually do have these se secret techniques and powers. And I mean, there was an element of that in Johnny's story. Like in the movie, it's just they, they think I don't do my own stunts. So I'm going to prove I know Kung Fu in the games. It was I do I do my own special effects and people think it's just CGI. Uh, yeah. That, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a definitely a good point, and yeah, I never really thought about it like that, and hopefully they do play that up a little bit more, because yeah, that wasn't even something I noticed until you just mentioned that, so that's that's a, that's a really cool little detail. Um, I hope they do uh, implement that more going forward, especially, you know, there's no reason why you can't have that uh, in his fatality, or at least you know, something like that. Him powering up or just, you know, focusing more on his chi, etc. It's, it's, it's just something, like, I'd, I'd mostly like to see it, like, in the movies or, like, if whatever web series they do next, because, like, Legacy sort of played with it in the second season where, like, when they get to the island for the tournament, Raiden's all like, you're in a magical place, so you're going to start discovering powers. But I just, you know... I'd yeah. sort of like to see them not shy away from the special moves when they make a movie or whatever, you know? Right. Yeah, agreed. Um, well, that'll that's pretty much going to wrap it up for this episode. Um we're going to we'll be putting this up and uh if you guys liked what you heard, um comment and just leave feedback, constructive feedback, criticism, whatever you want. Um, just let us know what you thought, and um, episodes usually won't go this long, but we had a lot to cover tonight, so yeah, just let us know what you think, and if you have any questions or comments, just put them up there, and we'll definitely uh, take them under consideration, and any suggestions we'll definitely consider, and yeah, if you want us to answer anything, we'll definitely do that for you too, and if you'd ever like to be on the show, we're... Uh, We'd, we'd love to have you on. Just say something or message one of us and we'll consider having you on. We got a few people in mind going forward. But yeah, we're hoping to do this pretty much weekly. So probably Wednesday nights and then they'll be out late Wednesday or Thursday. Um, yeah, so hopefully you guys like the show. If not, tell us why and we'll try and improve going forward. And uh, that'll, that'll wrap it up. Next week uh, or on our next episode, we'll be covering... Uh, the new characters introduced into MKX and going into detail in depth with them. We'll uh, talk about another character in MK history, and we'll probably be talking about some other recent news, uh, such as the comics and the web series and our expectations. And uh, we got a lot more coming uh, down the pipeline um, relating to everything MKX and MK in the past. We want to kind of dive into this and cover everything. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and uh, we'll catch you next week. So... For uh, temporary username, Razor, uh, Shadowloo, and myself, we'll see you guys later. Take care. Take it easy. Next time. That was pathetic.